Does the name Dealey Plaza mean anything to you? How about if we mention Dallas, the 22nd of November, 1963, the Grassy Knoll, the Texas School Book Depository? Dealey Plaza is the nondescript stretch of public highway where John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States of America, was assassinated as he rode in an open-top 1961 Lincoln Continental limousine with his wife Jacqueline. Three shots rang out in quick succession across the plaza, taking police, secret service agents, and the surrounding public by complete surprise. Controversy still surrounds this brutal slaying that shocked a nation, and indeed the world. Two days later, the man accused of shooting him, Lee Harvey Oswald, was himself shot dead by Jack Ruby while being escorted by detectives to the county jail. The death of the main suspect was a major factor in the development of perhaps the greatest web of conspiracy theories the world has ever known. Was it Harvey alone whose shot blew out the back right-hand part of JFK's head? and left Jackie Kennedy's pink Chanel suit splattered with blood and brain matter? The 1964 Warren Commission thought so. Did he have an accomplice? And who is really to blame? The CIA, the Mafia, the Cubans, the Israelis, the Soviet bloc, organized crime syndicates, Kennedy's vice president, Lyndon Bird Johnson, or the controversial FBI head, J. Edgar Hoover. All have been suggested as possible culprits at one time or another. One of the few things we know for sure is that Dealey Plaza will forever be remembered as the place where JFK took his last breath. Place de Lalma is another spot that may not immediately ring bells of recognition. But as soon as you add the date Sunday the 31st of August 1997 and mention a speeding blue Mercedes, most people on the whole planet will instantly be transported back to where they were and what they were doing when they heard the news that Princess Diana had been killed. Just after midnight on that date, the car in which she was traveling hit a pillar in the Parisian tunnel at Pont de l'Alma, a bridge across the River Seine. Also killed were her lover Dodi al Fayed and the French driver Henri Paul. The princess's bodyguard, Trevor Rhys Jones, survived, but with serious facial injuries and little recollection of what had happened. The public outpouring of grief and disbelief was unprecedented. For a while, it even seemed as if the events might cause the toppling of the British monarchy when the royal family's reaction to Diana's death, adhering strictly to age-old protocol, didn't tie in with the popular mood. A decade after the crash, the seemingly endless inquiries and inquests, and even more endless conspiracy theories, prove that the world's fascination for the people's princess remains strong. Fanning the flames, Mohammed al Fayed, owner of London's most famous store, Harrods, has been tireless in his determination to uncover what, or who, really caused the deaths of his son and the world's most photographed woman. Will he or we ever find out the truth behind the mysterious white Fiat Uno, described by witnesses but never traced? Was it the paparazzi in the tunnel that night, or members of England's Secret Service, MI6? We may never know, and while questions remain, the Place de l'Alma will continue to draw sightseers and fans, all eager to witness for themselves the spot where the 36-year-old Queen of Hearts met her tragic and untimely end. From the 13th of August, 1961, to the 9th of November, 1989, a thin stretch of land over 150 kilometers long was one of the most infamous spots in the world. It may have been made from concrete and barbed wire, but for 28 years, the Berlin Wall was the world's most visible symbol of the Iron Curtain, physically separating communism from democracy. 43 kilometers of it ran through the middle of Berlin, dividing the Soviet-style German Democratic Republic from the Federal Republic of Germany which controlled West Berlin. But how did such a complicated arrangement come about in the first place? 
For the answer to that, we have to go back even further, to 1945. The post-World War II amicable subdivision of Germany into French, American, British and Soviet controlled sections ran into severe trouble with the advent of the Cold War. By 1961, economic and political tensions had seen so many East Berliners migrate to the West, the East German government erected what they called an anti-fascist protection barrier. Over the next 28 years, the original wire fence was greatly fortified until in 1975, it became the sophisticated Grenzmauer, 45,000 separate sections of reinforced concrete, each 3.6 meters high and 1.2 meters wide. During the wall's existence, over 200 people were killed trying to cross it. The fall of communism across Eastern Europe eventually led to euphoric scenes as thousands of East Berliners surged through border crossing points on the 9th of November 1989. German reunification concluded a year later on the 3rd of October 1990. Today, all that remains are small sections of concrete memorials to the fact that no wall lasts forever. The next infamous place is around 41 degrees north, 49 degrees west. That's right, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Even if filmmaker James Cameron hadn't focused on its tragic end for the most profitable movie of all time to date, the RMS Titanic would still need little introduction. Only four days into its maiden voyage from Southampton, England, en route to New York, at 11.40 p.m. on the 14th of April, 1912, the ship hit an iceberg and sank two hours and 40 minutes later. Over the centuries, there have been thousands of wrecked ships and other nautical disasters, but above all others, the story of this doomed liner continues to fascinate people the world over. The sinking is still the worst British civilian maritime disaster in history, although there have been greater losses of life elsewhere, and especially in wartime. Perhaps Titanic's fame is due to the grandiose claims made about the vessel. The biggest passenger steamship at the time of its launch, it was claimed by the Shipbuilder magazine to be practically unsinkable. The transatlantic superliner also boasted the last word in luxury, with opulent staircases, a gymnasium, Turkish bath, squash court, library, and sumptuous restaurant, the Café Parisien. And then, of course, there are all the mistakes that were made during its sinking. The fact that there were only enough lifeboats for half of the passengers, and that many of them were launched half full, or that the nearby SS Californian had its wireless turned off for the night and, confused by the colors, ignored the Titanic's distress rockets. But also remembered are the acts of heroism, from dauntless souls like Wallace Hartley and his orchestra, who played on as the ship went down, or the unsinkable Molly Brown, who herded women and children onto the lifeboats. but mostly the Titanic will be remembered for showing so clearly what terrible consequences can arise when mistakes are made out of greed, stupidity, carelessness, and simple bad luck. Although there remains some disagreement as to the exact number, around 1,500 lives were lost that night, needlessly. Oh, the humanity. These were the famous words that echoed around the globe as radio reporter Herbert Morrison expressed his raw shock and horror on witnessing the terrible scenes at New Jersey's Lakehurst Naval Air Station on the 6th of May, 1937. This was the day that the Hindenburg airship burst into flames as it neared the landing field, killing 13 passengers, 22 crew, and one member of the ground crew, including the director of flight operations, Ernst Lehmann. Morrison's recorded words were later added to the newsreel footage of the catastrophe, sound and vision that remain shocking today, 70 years after the event. The LZ-129 Hindenburg was one of the largest aircraft ever built, a German-built Zeppelin that had been in service only a year before disaster struck. What many people don't realize, though, is that prior to the Hindenburg tragedy, Zeppelin airships, which had been flying for over 30 years, had an impressive safety record. The Graf Zeppelin had flown over a million miles and circumnavigated the globe, and in its first year of service, the Hindenburg had already covered around 200,000 miles, ferried nearly 2,800 passengers, and made 17 round trips across the Atlantic Ocean. Nobody really knows what triggered the inferno, but several theories exist. 
Many have blamed the fact that the craft was filled with the highly flammable hydrogen rather than helium, due to a United States military embargo on the less volatile gas. There was also the suggestion that the fire was the work of anti-Nazi saboteurs, or, as the former head of the Zeppelin company, Dr. Hugo Eckener, believed, that Captain Max Pruss mishandled the entire landing maneuver. Was it a static spark, lightning, or incendiary paint? What is certain is that the stunning and widely seen footage of the accident sounded a death knell for the giant passenger-carrying airships after a golden age that had lasted for almost 40 years. Now here's an address that needs no introduction. Pulling 700,000 visitors a year, Graceland is the second most visited home in the United States after the White House. On a par with such famous regal residences as Buckingham Palace and the Palace of Versailles, 3764 Elvis Presley Boulevard is one of the most recognized dwellings on the planet. It was thanks to the events of one fateful day, 16th of August 1977, that Graceland joins our list of infamous places. The day that Elvis Presley, the most popular and successful entertainer of all time, was found dead in his bathroom, killed by an overdose of prescription drugs and complications from severe heart disease. He was 42. The estate was in dire financial straits at the time of Elvis's death, losing half a million US dollars a year. Its fortunes were turned around in 1982 when Priscilla, Elvis's ex-wife, decided to turn the place into a museum, a move that paid off handsomely. And today, Graceland is more popular than ever, especially during August, when the Elvis Tribute Week has Memphis throbbing with all things Elvis, including the emotional candlelight ceremony. On Tuesday the 1st of March, 1932, the Lindbergh Farm in Hopewell, New Jersey, became the center of an investigation that was to be remembered as the criminal case of the century. With crudely scribbled ransom notes and $14,000 found hidden in his garage, German carpenter Bruno Richard Hauptmann quickly became the number one suspect in the crime that shocked America. After a five-week trial in New Jersey, Hauptmann was found guilty of kidnapping and murdering Charles Augustus Lindbergh, Jr., the 20-month-old son of world-famous aviator Colonel Lindbergh. Sentenced to death, he was electrocuted on the 3rd of April, 1936. In the mid-1950s, the Suez Canal was one of the most strategically important waterways in the world. Britain no longer needed it to protect its ever-dwindling empire, but it was a vital oil route, with two-thirds of Europe's oil passing through it by 1955. In July 1956, Egypt nationalized the canal, leading to a 250,000-strong Anglo-French-Israeli invasion. On the 29th of October, Israeli paratroopers and ground forces attacked the Sinai Peninsula, while British and French troops launched Operation Musketeer two days later, attacking Egypt by air and sea. Egyptian President Nasser responded by sinking 40 ships in the canal, closing it to all traffic. The 70,000 Egyptian forces were quickly overwhelmed, but world opinion labeled the invasion an act of aggression. The invading forces had made the fatal error of not securing American support for the offensive. And, even more significantly, Soviet Union leader Nikita Khrushchev threatened to intervene on the Egyptian side. The United States appealed to the United Nations. The General Assembly passed the Uniting for Peace resolution and ordered a ceasefire leading to the end of hostilities in March 1957 and the first ever introduction of a UN peacekeeping force. The whole affair was a political debacle for Britain and France and greatly marked their decline as global powers. You might not expect a sea collision ending in the deaths of 46 people to be described as a story with a happy ending, but there were another 1,660 crew and passengers who survived the sinking of the Andrea Doria, thanks to a well-orchestrated and speedy rescue operation, which saved this maritime disaster of July 1956 from being another Titanic. Thick fog off the coast of Nantucket in the USA was the main culprit when the Italian line's luxury ocean liner, the SS Andrea Doria, was hit in the side by the Swedish-American line's SS Stockholm and sank the next morning. Miraculously, 14-year-old Linda Morgan survived only by being catapulted from the Andrea Doria onto the Stockholm's bow.
Even before famous resident and former president Bill Clinton put Little Rock, Arkansas on the map, the American town hit the headlines for different political reasons. On the 23rd of September 1957, nine African-American students were denied access to the Central High School by an angry, anti-integrationist mob of over 1,000 white students and their supporters. This led to a showdown between President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who marshaled 1,200 soldiers to escort the students to school, and Governor Orville Phobos, who tried to physically prevent the students from entering the school with the help of the National Guard. The crisis escalated to such an extent that the school was shut down for most of 1959, before finally reopening as an integrated school system toward the end of the year. Having been spat at and abused, the nine students all went on to distinguish themselves. They became writers, professors, civil rights activists, publishers and educators. During their ordeal, the Little Rock Nine were advised by local journalist and activist Daisy Bates. Along with Bates, the students received the Spingarn Medal in 1958, and the Nine also received the Congressional Gold Medal in November 1999 in recognition of their brave stand. In 1996, seven of them appeared on The Oprah Winfrey Show and even reconciled with some of their tormentors from that time. The most memorable apology was made to Elizabeth Eckford by Hazel Bryan Massery. It was Massery who was caught screaming at Eckford in a widely published photograph at the height of the confrontation and had regretted it ever since. In a world of infamous places, there is one instantly recognizable name that inspires more dread and horror than any other, Hiroshima. On the 6th of August, 1945, the US B-29, dubbed the Enola Gay, flew over the Japanese city and at 8.15 a.m. local time, dropped a nuclear bomb called Little Boy. The plane was piloted by 509th Composite Group Commander Colonel Paul Tibbetts and was launched from an airbase in the West Pacific, six hours flight time from Japan. The bomb, a gun-type fission weapon with 60 kilograms of uranium-235, exploded about 600 meters above the city, killing at least 80,000 people outright and completely destroying nearly 70% of the city's infrastructure. An estimated 60,000 further deaths occurred in the following months, and thousands have also died since then of illnesses caused by the bomb, such as radiation poisoning. The city of Hiroshima was targeted for several reasons. It was large, with a population of approximately 255,000. It was surrounded by hills, which focused the bomb's destructive power, and it housed important army bases, including the headquarters of the 5th Division and the 2nd General Army, which commanded the defense of all of southern Japan. It had not been targeted by American bombing during the war, making it possible to accurately measure the atomic bomb's effects, and there were also no prisoner of war camps. These reasons combined resulted in Washington making it their primary target. The research and development project that resulted in the design and construction of the world's first atomic bombs was named the Manhattan Project. It was originally instigated by European refugee scientists afraid that Nazi Germany was developing a similar program. At a cost of nearly two billion US dollars, it was one of the largest and most expensive R&D programs ever. Following the first atomic bomb test detonation in New Mexico in July, the Little Boy bomb was dropped on Hiroshima by the armed forces of the United States of America under President Harry S. Truman, as was Fat Man, the second bomb detonated over Nagasaki three days later, killing an estimated 74,000 people. In both cities, most of those killed and wounded were civilians. The US made the momentous decision to use nuclear weapons in a bid to force Japan's surrender and end the six-year-old Second World War. Japan did indeed surrender on the 15th of August, but the role of the bombings in that decision has been the subject of debate ever since. The US government's position was that the bombings would hasten the end of the war and result in far fewer deaths on both sides of the conflict than if the planned invasion of Japan had gone ahead. In Japan, the view was that the attacks were unjustified and the magnitude of the devastation made the actions inherently immoral. Many people around the world agreed, including such luminaries as Albert Camus and a number of the scientists involved with the Manhattan Project such as Dr. James Frank, Albert Einstein, and Leo Szilard. The future president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, wrote of his grave misgivings in his memoir, The White House Years, citing his belief that Japan was already defeated 
and that America should avoid shocking world opinion by the use of a weapon whose employment was no longer mandatory as a measure to save American lives. The director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at the American University in Washington, Peter Kuznick, wrote these damning words about President Truman. He knew he was beginning the process of annihilation of the species. It was not just a war crime, it was a crime against humanity. Kuznick was also one of several commentators who believed that America's ulterior motive in detonating the atomic bomb was to show the Russians the horrifying capabilities of its new weapon of mass destruction and cement its place as the global superpower in the post-World War II landscape. Following the horrific events in Hiroshima, the city was rebuilt. The closest surviving building to where the bomb was detonated was renamed Genbaku Dome, or the Atomic Dome, and became part of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. Every year on the 6th of August, also known as A-Bomb Day, the city holds the Peace Memorial Ceremony in the Memorial Park in honor of the victims and to pray for world peace. Unsurprisingly, to this day, the city's government is a strong advocate of the abolition of all nuclear weapons. There are certain dates that are etched into the American national consciousness. The 4th of July, 1776, the date of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, is one of the earliest. One of the most recent is, of course, September the 11th, 2001, a date that needs no explanation. And then there is the 7th of December, 1941, a day President Franklin D. Roosevelt described to the US Congress as a date that will live in infamy. On this particular Sunday morning, the naval forces of the Empire of Japan carried out a surprise attack on the US naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, resulting in an overwhelming Japanese victory and the long-awaited entry of the United States of America into the Second World War, two years after it broke out in Europe. The ambush resulted in heavy losses for the Americans. There were 2,403 dead and 1,178 wounded. They lost 188 aircraft, five battleships, one mine layer, and three destroyers were either sunk or badly damaged. The Japanese got off much more lightly, with 64 dead, one captured, and the loss of 29 aircraft and five midget submarines. As with so many acts of hostility, one of the chief reasons behind Japan's actions was access to oil. Japan was determined to protect its move into Singapore and the Dutch East Indies, where it was securing access to such natural resources as the notorious black gold. The attack was also the almost inevitable result of a period of escalating embargoes and sanctions between the two countries, as the US, backed by the League of Nations, responded to Japan's expansionist policies in Asia, especially with regards to its heightened conflict with China from 1937 onwards. The air raid attack on Pearl Harbor began at 7.48 a.m. and was all over 90 minutes later. The Americans were completely unprepared. Despite intelligence suggesting increased Japanese aggression and warnings that war with Japan was inevitable, there had been no specific indication of an attack on Pearl Harbor. It was Commander Logan Ramsey who sent the now famous telegram, Air Raid, Pearl Harbor, this is not drill. And even with their lack of readiness, many Americans responded to the call with courage and fortitude. One of the most well-documented single defenders was Doris Dory Miller, a ship's cook, who without any training in the use of the weapon, took over an unattended aircraft gun and fired on the attacking planes, even while his ship was being bombed. He was awarded the Navy Cross, while another 14 sailors and officers received the Medal of Honor. Even though there was heavy loss of life on the American side, however, important infrastructure, including the submarine base, the power station, and the cryptanalysis unit survived. And a prime Japanese objective, the destruction of the three Pacific-based American aircraft carriers, failed, because none of the ships was present at the time. Consequently, the US's recovery was swifter than expected, and the country was able to fully engage in the war in the Pacific within months. Despite its decisive victory in its preemptive attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan's strategy was soon exposed as disastrous. With President Roosevelt declaring war the day after the attack, 
the US was soon utilizing its huge military and economic resources to join its allies against Japan, Germany and Italy, leading to the total defeat of the Axis powers by 1945. Indeed, on hearing that the Pearl Harbor attack had brought America into the war, the Prime Minister of Britain, Sir Winston Churchill, wrote, being saturated and satiated with emotion and sensation, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved and thankful. On the 1st of August, 1966, student Charles Joseph Whitman killed his wife and mother before barricading himself in the tower of the University of Texas in Austin. From there, the so-called Texas sniper began shooting, killing 14 people and injuring 29, before being shot and killed himself by Austin police. Suicide notes were inconclusive, but the brain tumor revealed in Whitman's autopsy led to speculation that this was the cause of his actions. Until Chernobyl, the most frightening and widely publicized nuclear power station accident was the partial meltdown of the core at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania in 1979. But after five tense days, the situation there was brought under control. In the Ukraine, just seven years later, the world would not be so lucky. On the 26th of April, 1986, there was a steam explosion in reactor number four of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in the town of Pripet, a committee formed to investigate the accident, led by Valery Legosov, arrived at Chernobyl in the evening of 26th of April. By that time, two people were dead and 52 were hospitalized. During the night, the committee, faced with overwhelming evidence of extremely high levels of radiation and a number of cases of radiation exposure, had to acknowledge the destruction of the reactor and order the evacuation of the nearby city. To date, it remains the worst ever accident of its kind. Although it is difficult to pinpoint the number of deaths it caused, or is still causing today, due to the nature of radiation sickness and Soviet secrecy. What is known is that 336,000 people were evacuated and resettled, and the radioactive fallout drifted far and wide, affecting parts of the Western Soviet Union, Eastern, Western, and Northern Europe, and even as far away as Eastern North America. The most badly contaminated areas were in the Ukraine, Russia and Belarus, with the latter country receiving about 60% of the fallout. Why did it happen? The power plant was still relatively new, construction having begun only a decade earlier. Reactor number four was only three years old, and plans were still underway for the construction of reactors number five and six. It is clear that human error had a lot to do with the catastrophe. Procedures weren't followed, safety systems were switched off, and operators were inexperienced and insufficiently trained. But there has also been much finger-pointing at alleged flaws in the reactor's design, particularly the all-important control rods. It is also thought the damage was so widespread because the reactor was built with only partial containment due to its large size and as a cost-cutting exercise. And yet there is one most unexpected silver lining to the events at Chernobyl. Though the sarcophagus covering reactor number four is deteriorating rapidly, threatening a fresh disaster, the exclusion zone, having been deserted by humans, has become a haven for wildlife, with many species of fauna previously never seen in the area plentiful and thriving. There is huge disagreement over the exact numbers of people affected by the accident, the Chernobyl Forum gave a conservative estimate of around 9,000 deaths and predicted deaths from cancer. While a Greenpeace report argued the numbers in Belarus, Russia and the Ukraine alone could account for up to 200,000 deaths between 1990 and 2004. Belarus's infant mortality rate is said to be 300% higher than the rest of Europe, and thyroid cancer is 10,000 times more frequent than it was before April 1986. These ongoing effects mean that the name Chernobyl will remain infamous for many years to come. The place was the New London School in Texas. The date was the 18th of March, 1937. The event was the deadliest ever to take place in a US school building. 
Despite the Great Depression, New London was a prosperous town, thanks to an oil find seven years earlier. And the school had been constructed for the princely sum of $1 million. But still, shortcuts were taken. To save money, the natural gas contract had been cancelled, and a tap had been installed into a residue gas line. This would be the school's undoing. Being odourless and colourless, leaking gas had been causing the students headaches but was undetected until that Thursday afternoon in March. Triggered by the switching on of an electric sander, the explosion destroyed the school, killing at least 300 people. The blast actually blew the roof off the school. As it crashed back down, it caused the entire building to collapse. Aid was swift and plentiful, with parents, the Texas National Guard and even Boy Scouts taking part in the heartbreaking task of recovering the bodies. One mother didn't make it, succumbing to a heart attack on discovering her daughter had been literally blown to pieces. Even reporters were drafted in to help. A young Walter Cronkite was on one of his first assignments and was later to say, I did nothing in my studies nor in my life to prepare me for a story of the magnitude of that New London tragedy, nor has any story since that awful day equaled it. And this was from a man who would later cover the Second World War and the Nuremberg trials. Two years later, a new school was completed, which kept the name New London until 1965. Since then, it has been known as the West Rusk High School. A lawsuit brought against the gasoline company in the school found neither could be held responsible. But some good did come of the tragedy. To prevent such a thing from ever happening again, it was ruled that strong-smelling thiols be added to natural gas so that any leaks could be discovered quickly. It was a practice that soon took off around the world. On the 29th of October, 1932, three years to the day after the Wall Street crash, the most powerful steam turbo-electric propelled passenger ship ever constructed was launched in front of 200,000 people lining the banks of the Loire River in France. But the infamous place associated with the French line's SS Normandy would be on the other side of the world, New York Harbor to be exact, in 1942. After the fall of France in 1940, the US government seized the Normandy, and in 1941, the Navy decided to convert her into a troop ship called the USS Lafayette. But on the 9th of February the following year, as she was moored at Manhattan's Pier 88, the sparks from a welding torch ignited the kapok used to stuff the thousands of life jackets stored in the first-class dining room. With the ship's fire protection system disabled during the conversion, the fire spread rapidly, and the hoses of the New York City Fire Department did not fit the ship's French-designed inlets. All on board abandoned ship. As firefighters on shore and in fireboats poured water on the flames, the ship developed a dangerous list to port due to the greater amount of water being pumped onto the seaward side of the vessel by fireboats. The ship's designer, Vladimir Yorkovich, had been at the scene and had suggested opening the seacocks, thus flooding the lower decks and causing the ship to settle the few feet to the bottom of the dock. Thus stabilized, water could be pumped into the burning areas without the risk of capsize. However, this suggestion was not acted upon. Around 2.45 a.m. the next morning, the ship capsized, crushing a fireboat as she went over. It was a year before the expensive salvage operation could finally right the Normandy, but the proposed restoration was deemed simply too costly. Yorkovich wanted to restore her in a cut-down version, but could find no backers for his plan. She was sold to the salvage company for just over $160,000 and scrapped a mere four years later. Aeroplanes and bad weather can be a terrible mix. Just ask Patsy Klein or Buddy Holly or Manchester United Football Club. One of the UK's most famous and successful football teams was very nearly completely wiped out on the 8th of February 1958. After playing a European Cup match against the Yugoslavian team Red Star Belgrade, the club's chartered plane made a refueling stop in snowbound Munich. The pilot, Captain James Thane, made three attempts to take off from the slush-covered runway the last of which ended in tragedy as the plane failed to reach the correct altitude and crashed on top of an unoccupied house. Eight players died, along with 15 other passengers. The manager, Matt Busby, was so seriously injured he was twice read his last rites, but eventually he recovered enough to build a new team. But Captain Thane, originally blamed for the accident and not exonerated until 1968, died of a heart attack in 1975, aged only 53.
at least 1,800 dead, $81.2 billion worth of damage, 233,000 square kilometers declared a federal disaster area, around 3 million people left without electricity. Hurricane Katrina, which hit the Gulf Coast of the United States in August 2005, was one of the most devastating and certainly the costliest hurricane in US history. The storm first made landfall in South Florida on the 25th of August 2005. It was a Category 1 hurricane at the time and was the cause of 14 deaths in the state of Florida. By the 28th of August, Katrina had been upgraded to a Category 5 storm and the mayor of New Orleans, Ray Nagin, ordered a mandatory evacuation of the city, but he was too late. The greatest devastation occurred in New Orleans the next day, where Katrina's storm surge caused 53 levee breaches, disastrous for a city built below sea level. The National Science Foundation was later to find that the levee system had serious design flaws and had been inadequately maintained. Approximately 80% of the city was flooded and at least 700 bodies were plucked from the water. Around 26,000 people unable to evacuate the city took shelter in the Louisiana Superdome, which suffered substantial damage itself. It was also the site of mayhem and confusion as people struggled to access food, drink and facilities, and reports of violence and abuse began to circulate. Six deaths were confirmed at the venue. The effects of this natural disaster were so widespread and so devastating that the emergency services were unable to cope. Much criticism was made of the response from local, state and federal government, which led to a United States Congress investigation. In particular, blame was placed on Mayor Nagin and Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco for not implementing a timely evacuation plan and being generally unprepared to provide those ordered to shelters with food, water, sanitation and security. The only bodies not to face criticism were the National Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service, which were both wildly praised for both the accuracy and long lead times of their forecasts. The international response was strong, though, with countries like Kuwait and South Korea sending millions of dollars in aid. A sign of the city's recovery was the reopening of the Superdome in September 2006, when the city's football team, the New Orleans Saints, played the Atlanta Falcons. Before the match, rock superstars U2 and Green Day joined forces to serenade the crowd in the opening ceremonies. Prior to Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans was an extremely popular tourist destination, famous for its architecture, food, jazz music, and love of festivals. In particular, the annual Mardi Gras. Just over five months after Katrina, the 2006 parade went ahead with many references to the city's recent history. The costumes and floats making pointed allusions to such bodies as the Federal Emergency Management Agency, whose director, Michael Brown, resigned following the disaster. The parade was scaled down, but had a heightened intensity as the citizens of New Orleans, many of whom had lost everything, celebrated the fact that they were still alive. The 1st of September, 1939, 4.45 in the morning. This was the exact time that the Second World War began. There may have been no formal declaration of war on Germany's part, but that didn't stop its battleship, the Schleswig-Holstein, beginning the Battle of Westerplatte in Gdansk in Poland. Having anchored in the channel while pretending to make a courtesy visit to the region, the ship started shelling the Polish garrison, expecting German military superiority and the advantage of a surprise attack to lead to a swift and decisive victory. Things didn't quite turn out the way Hitler had planned, however, with the bombardment carrying on for several days and the Germans sustaining heavy losses. There were approximately 2,600 German soldiers involved in the battle against a Polish garrison of only 205. The Poles were defeated finally by exhaustion and dwindling food, water, ammunition and medical supplies. The Poles formally surrendered on the 7th of September, but the invasion had already prompted the UK, France, Australia and New Zealand to retaliate all officially declaring war on Germany four days earlier. Some infamous places were once innocuous spots on the planet until a certain event thrust them into the world spotlight. This is most definitely not the case with the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York. The first idea for the seven-building complex came in 1960 from an association created and chaired by David Rockefeller and backed by the governor of New York, Rockefeller's brother Nelson. It was developed by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and designed for the most part by US architect Minoru Yamasaki. Completed in 1972, 
The imposing silhouettes of One World Trade Center and Two World Trade Center, or the North and South Towers, dominated the Big Apple for the next nearly 30 years. 110 stories high, the World Trade Center had a floor area of 800,000 square meters and was 526.3 meters to the tip of the antenna on one WTC. The buildings were not without criticism, however. There were complaints about the narrow windows, which were a reflection of architect Yamisaki's fear of heights and desire to make the building's occupants feel more secure. And a popular joke in the 70s was that the two towers were the boxes in which the Empire State and the Chrysler building had been packed. But all the jokes stopped on the morning of September the 11th, 2001. At 8.46 a.m., hijackers flew American Air Flight's Flight 11 into the northern facade of the North Tower. Just 17 minutes later, a second team of hijackers flew United Airlines Flight 175 into the South Tower, which collapsed 56 minutes later. At 10.28 a.m., the North Tower followed suit. There were approximately 16,000 people below the areas of impact at the time, and most of them survived, evacuating before the collapse of the buildings. At least 2,603 people, however, did not get out. Hundreds were killed at the moment of impact, and at least 200 people jumped to their deaths from the burning towers. Only 18 people above the South Tower's impact zone managed to make it out of the building before it collapsed. To this day, 24 people remain listed as missing, and there are reports of about 10,000 bone fragments that simply cannot be matched to the list of the dead. All of the dead were civilians, with the average age being 40 years old. The oldest victim was an 82-year-old passenger on Flight 11, and the youngest a two-year-old on Flight 175. The Twin Towers weren't the only scenes of destruction on that day. One of the other hijacked planes, American Airlines Flight 77, crashed into the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, killing more than 100 people inside, as well as everyone on board the plane. The terrorist attacks of 9-11 will go down in history as being the first truly infamous event of the new millennium, and the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, the definitive infamous place. On the 26th of December, 2004, the second largest earthquake ever recorded on a seismograph between 9.1 and 9.3 in magnitude took place under the Indian Ocean off the western coast of Sumatra. Over eight minutes in duration, the quake was also the longest lasting, as well as the eighth deadliest natural disaster ever recorded. It triggered a number of tsunamis that became known in some parts of the world as the Asian tsunami and in others as the Boxing Day tsunami. Following the sudden vertical rise of the seabed, the waters receded from the shores of such countries as Indonesia, India, Sri Lanka and Thailand, and then poured back in with devastating effects. Like all tsunamis, the phenomenon behaved very differently in shallow water than it did in deep water. Far out at sea, the waves moved quickly and were small and hardly noticeable. But the massive displacement of water in the shallows nearer the shoreline slowed the tsunami's speed considerably and resulted in a succession of huge waves which rolled inland in roughly 30-minute cycles. The third was the biggest and the most cataclysmic, with waves up to 30 metres high destroying towns and villages and travelling up to two kilometres inland. The force of the waves was calculated to be the equivalent of five megatons of TNT. That's over twice the entire explosive force used during all of the Second World War, including the atomic bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The 1600 kilometer fault line stretched from north to south, so the waves with the greatest impact were the ones traveling to the east and west. This meant that countries like Bangladesh, which is a low-lying country at the northern end of the Bay of Bengal, and therefore quite near to the quake's epicenter, reported only two deaths after the capsize of a tourist boat. Other countries were not so lucky, and distance was no guarantee of safety. Somalia, 4,500 kilometers away on the northeastern coast of Africa, lost nearly 300 people, and a further 5,000 were displaced. The worst hit country was Indonesia. While exact numbers of casualties are impossible to gauge, original estimates put the number of deaths at around 170,000. Although in 2005, the Indonesian health minister updated that total to 220,000. 
In the northern provincial capital of Banda Aceh, one of the hardest hit areas, there were 30,000 deaths. The casualties in India, Thailand and Sri Lanka also numbered in the thousands, with the overall estimated loss of life near to 300,000 and within the vicinity of 1.7 million people losing their homes. Unable to resist the force of the water, children made up at least a third of the casualties, while relief agencies reported that four times as many women were killed as men as they waited on beaches for their fishermen husbands to return. Tourists also suffered badly, with Europe particularly affected. Sweden and Germany confirmed over 500 deaths each. Amongst those dead were 14-year-old Lucy Holland, the granddaughter of English film director Richard Attenborough, and the fashion photographer Simon Attlee. Brazil lost its diplomat, Lis Ameo de Benedict Davola, who, with her young son, died in Pipi, Thailand. Amongst all the horror, though, there were some amazing stories of courage, resilience, and quick thinking. Before the tsunami hit northern Phuket in Thailand, a 10-year-old British schoolgirl called Tilly Smith spotted the warning signs of the receding ocean and, remembering her geography lessons, alerted her parents to the danger. They raised the alarm and everyone on the beach was safely evacuated. Because the effects of the disaster were felt on such a global scale and the news images were so horrifying, the amount of aid sent to the stricken areas was unprecedented, amounting to seven billion US dollars. But the physical, psychological and political ramifications were so profound that while relief was swift and for the most part well orchestrated, the recovery process will stretch on for decades. The largest attack submarine ever built, the Russian K-141 Kursk, was laid down in 1992 and launched two years later. 154 meters long and four stories high, she had a diving depth of between 300 and 600 meters. The sub was commissioned as part of the Russian Northern Fleet and was the last of the Oscar II-class submarines designed and built in the Soviet era. In August 2000, the Kursk set out on a dummy torpedo drill, along with three other attack subs, the fleet's flagship, Peter the Great, and some smaller ships. At 11.28 local time on the 12th of August, the Kursk fired the first of its dummy torpedoes at the flagship, but there was an explosion. The cause is the subject of much debate. Was it due to defects in the experimental torpedo? Or was it in fact the result of a collision with another sub, possibly a foreign vessel, as many believe? The explosion measured 2.2 on the Richter scale and caused the Kursk to sink over 100 meters to the bottom of the Barents Sea. A second explosion, twice as powerful as the first, occurred a couple of minutes later. Though most of the submarine's crew were killed outright in those first two explosions, 23 of the 118 crew members aboard survived in compartment 9, the one furthest away from the blasts. But despite rescue attempts from British and Norwegian naval teams, these men could not be reached in time and also died. While Russian authorities tried to claim that their survival was brief, notes found on the body of Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kolesnikov suggested that he and his men had hung on for hours. Also found in compartment 9 were potassium superoxide chemical cartridges, which are used to absorb carbon dioxide and chemically release oxygen. This suggests the crew members had survived for several days before a flash fire used up the rest of the oxygen, leading to death by asphyxiation. The badly damaged ship was eventually salvaged by a Dutch team in 2001, which cut off the bow during the process. All the bodies were recovered and finally laid to rest. The 11th of May 1985 was supposed to be a day of celebration for the Bradford City Football Club as it marked the English team's triumph as winners of the third division trophy. Instead, it is a day that is now remembered by the citizens of the town as one of horror, as 54 of the team's supporters and two fans of the visiting Lincoln City side were killed as fire swept through the Valley Parade football stadium. Another 450 were injured, half of them requiring hospital treatment. Many of the others were helped by members of the local British Asian community who immediately opened up their homes around the ground and rushed to help. Knowing that their team had already won the third division championship, 
Bradford City's fans had turned out in great numbers for the match. The 11,076 strong crowd was double the average attendance for the season. The fire started 40 minutes into the match, with the score standing at nil-nil. A pile of rubbish beneath the stand was accidentally ignited by a discarded cigarette, and the fire took hold rapidly, with spectators being moved onto the playing field to escape the flames. Those at the rear of the 77-year-old wooden stand, however, were trapped by inward opening exit doors and locked turnstiles, and were quickly overcome by the toxic smoke. The number of deaths would have been even greater if it hadn't been for the actions of those who had already escaped the fire. 28 police officers and 22 supporters were publicly recognized as having saved at least one life and later received bravery awards. An inquiry into the fire also led to new laws to improve safety at UK football grounds. There was a ban on the building of wooden grandstands, and the Valley Parade Stadium of today is very different to the one of 1985, with only the clubhouse and one flank support wall of the original structure remaining. And every year, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of May, a memorial service is held by the City Hall, followed by a minute silence to remember those who lost their lives. Located in the Cascade Range and part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, the active stratovolcano Mount St. Helens in Skamania County, Washington, may look peaceful enough now, but climbers have learned not to be complacent where it is concerned, knowing that at any time its trails may again be closed to them, like they were after the 18th of May, 1980. The volcano's most infamous eruption, causing the deaths of 57 people and 7,000 big game animals, was the deadliest volcanic activity ever in the United States. It was also the most economically destructive event of its kind, with the loss of 250 homes, plus the destruction of bridges, roads and railway tracks. An earthquake two months earlier had started the seismic activity, leading to a 5.1 magnitude quake on the 18th of May. The massive eruption saw the entire north face of the mountain collapse, and the resulting debris avalanche was the biggest in recorded history. When it was all over, the mountain summit had been reduced by 400 meters to 2,550 meters. In the years since the 1980 eruption, the mountain has continued to change. It was initially left to return to its natural state, but was reopened to climbers by the National Forest Service in 1987. Seven years later, it was again closed when magma reached the volcano's surface in early October. In March 2005, the mountain spewed out a plume of steam and ash, soaring 11,000 meters into the sky that could be seen from Seattle. Archaeological surveys point to human settlement around Mount St. Helens for the past 6,500 years and numerous volcanic events. Are we due for an even bigger eruption than the one of May 1980? Only time will tell. This is the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. It was here at one minute past six on the evening of the 4th of April, 1968, that the Baptist minister and civil rights movement leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot in the throat. He was pronounced dead little more than an hour later at St. Joseph Hospital. King is one of the most loved and revered figures in recent American history. In his lifetime, and posthumously, he was the recipient of numerous awards and prizes. In 1964, at the age of 35, he became the youngest person ever to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. One of the main reasons King received such recognition was because, like Mahatma Gandhi before him, he espoused the philosophy of non-violent civil disobedience. This sometimes led to conflict with other African-American leaders who believed in more direct means of protest. Malcolm X called the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom the farce on Washington, when its original focus on the desperate conditions faced by African Americans in the South was altered. King was one of the central figures who capitulated to President Kennedy's desire to make the march less strident in tone. In the end, the march was still a great success, with more than a quarter of a million attending. As news of King's death spread, there was a wave of riots in some 60 cities across America. On the 9th of April, five days after the shooting, President Lyndon B. Johnson declared a national day of mourning. The crowd who attended his funeral on the same day numbered 300,000 and included politicians like future President Richard Nixon and JFK's younger brother, Senator Bobby Kennedy, who would himself be cut down by an assassin's bullet only two months and two days later. During King's funeral, his close friend Mahalia Jackson sang his favorite hymn, Take My Hand, Precious Lord, and the eulogy was given by the man himself. 
A recording was played of his noted drum major sermon from the 4th of February 1968, in which he requested that his honours should not be recalled, but that he had tried to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and love and serve humanity. King's influence and prestige has only grown in the years following his assassination. Every year on the third Monday of January, close to his birthday on the 15th, America celebrates Martin Luther King Jr. Day as a public holiday. It was a sweltering hot night, the 11th of August, 1965. At about 7.45, California Highway Patrolman Lee W. Minicus pulled over Marquette Fry at the corner of 116th and Avalon in the Watts area of Los Angeles on the suspicion of drunk driving. When Fry's mother, Rena Price, and her stepson, Ronald, tried to intervene, they were also arrested. A crowd gathered, and before long, there was a full-scale riot underway. Many of those involved, though, would describe it differently, however, and the subsequent investigation, the McCone Commission, found deeper causes for the widespread burning of buildings, looting, and deaths. Despite the progress forged by the civil rights movement, many black Americans faced terrible poverty, inequality, and racial discrimination. In Los Angeles, there was particular resentment about the passage of Proposition 14 on the California ballot in November 1964. This had overturned the earlier Rumford Fair Housing Act, a law passed to give black people equal opportunity when it came to buying homes. During the six days of rioting, 34 people, most of them African-American, were killed, and more than 1,000 were injured. 4,000 were arrested. More than 600 buildings were destroyed, with white-owned businesses specifically targeted. The damage bill was estimated to be in the region of $35 million. Eventually, martial law was declared, and the National Guard moved into the area. Initially, 2,000 troops from the 160th Infantry and a squadron of the 18th Armoured Cavalry were mobilized. They were followed two days later by the rest of the 40th Armoured Division, and the next day by more troops from Northern California. In all, the National Guard presence numbered 15,000 men. They put a cordon around a large area of South Los Angeles, and the rioting was all but over by the Sunday night. After the riots, the government response was minimal, and little effort was made to address the problems or repair the damage. And it is probably no coincidence that the radical organization, the Black Panther Party of Self-Defense, formed in the state the following year. One of the most chilling sights of the 20th century, the mushroom cloud formed by an atomic explosion. It was a sight seen frequently at Bikini Atoll in the Republic of the Marshall Islands between 1946 and 1958, when the United States conducted more than 20 nuclear weapons tests in the area. Admiral William F. Halsey Jr., or Bull as he was known, oversaw operations as his old warship, the Independence, was one of those selected as a target vessel for the tests. Tagged the Pacific Proving Grounds, the bomb testing area saw the first detonation on the 1st of July, 1946, in Operation Crossroads. The idea of using ships as targets instead of detonating the bombs on land was to see what the effect atomic weapons would have on naval fleets. And the plane carrying the bombs was loaded with livestock, including goats, sheep, and mice, again to see what effects the blast and resulting radiation would have on the animals. Unfortunately, the Americans were similarly cavalier in their treatment of the indigenous people of the area. In 1954, Castle Bravo, the US's first dry fuel hydrogen bomb and its largest weapon ever detonated, turned out to be twice as powerful as predicted and cast its nuclear fallout far and wide. Islanders were quickly evacuated, but exposure to radiation left many of them with cancers and abnormally high rates of birth defects. The first bomb, given the moniker Abel, had a yield of 21 kilotons and was dropped from an altitude of 158 meters. Surprisingly, Abel didn't sink the independence, nor did the second test, another 21 kiloton bomb, dubbed Baker, which was actually detonated underwater at a depth of 27 meters on the 25th of July, 1946. Baker did cause a massive condensation cloud, however, which spread a huge amount of radioactive water onto the ships. The badly contaminated independence was subjected to further tests at Pearl Harbor before finally being scuttled off the coast of San Francisco in 1951. He's been dead for over 3,300 years, and yet his image is still instantly recognizable. The Egyptian boy king Tutankhamun ruled from 1333 BC to 1324 BC until his death at the age of only 18. 
This early demise meant for years historians wondered whether he'd been murdered, but a CT scan in 2005 suggested the most likely cause was gangrene following a badly broken leg. There's a good reason to believe he was not a significant or particularly memorable ruler, but since the discovery of his tomb, he has become perhaps the most famous of all ancient Egyptian figures. The reason for this is simple. When British Egyptologist Howard Carter and his team entered the tomb in November 1922, they found it to be almost completely intact, one of the richest and best preserved sites ever uncovered in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. And in all likelihood, this was a direct result of Tutankhamun's fall from prominence. Sealed up and forgotten, the tomb had even suffered the indignity of having some workers' cottages constructed over its entrance. The excavation of the site was long and painstaking. It was eight years until the last objects were removed from the tomb. Even today, there remain rumors of a curse attached to the site, with people taking a macabre delight in tales of early deaths suffered by those who entered the tomb. Research has indicated, though, that there is no statistical difference in dates of death between those in the original party who entered and those who did not. Indeed, most involved saw their 70th birthday. But why let truth get in the way of a good story? The history of the boy with the golden mask and the stunning artifacts found around him in death have now fascinated the world for nearly a century. The blockbuster touring exhibition, Treasures of Tutankhamun, which began at the British Museum in 1972, capitalized on that interest and was an enormous success. It has since been followed by more recent exhibitions, like 2005's Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs. When this particular tour finishes in Egypt in 2008, it is expected that three million people will have seen it. Perhaps that's why he's still smiling. He's enjoying the irony. It wasn't just the place, but the day itself that was infamous for King Alexander I of Yugoslavia. Having had three of his family members die on a Tuesday, he usually made it a rule not to carry out any public functions on that day of the week. On Tuesday the 9th of October 1934, however, the 45-year-old dictator was forced to make an exception. That was the day he arrived in Marseille in the south of France on the Yugoslav Navy destroyer, the Dubrovnik. He was making a state visit and hoping to strengthen an alliance between the two countries. He was met by the French foreign minister, Louis Bartou. As the king and Bartou drove through the streets, a gunman emerged from the crowd and shot both Alexander and the chauffeur dead. Bartou was also shot, but by a French policeman reacting to the confusion. He died later. The assassin was Vlado Chernozemsky, the driver of the leader of the internal Macedonian revolutionary organization. The remarkable footage of King Alexander's death, with the cameraman right on the spot as it happened, makes this one of the most historic early newsreels. And it wasn't only Alexander's death that was captured on film. His killer, Chernozemsky, was cut down by the sword of a French mounted policeman. He was then attacked by the crowd and also killed. Alexander's body was returned home on the Dubrovnik. He was buried at the Memorial Church of St. George, which had been built by his father, before eventually being transferred to a mausoleum in Beograd, as his will stipulated. Yugoslavia was then ruled by a regent, Prince Paul, until the signing of the Tripartite Pact with the Nazi-led Axis powers in 1941. All churches have a connection with the afterlife and a hint of what may become of us when we shuffle off this mortal coil. But few places of worship make the link between religion and death quite so apparent as the Cemetery Church of All Saints in Sedlik, which is a suburb of Kutnohora, right in the center of the Czech Republic. The chapel, also known as the Kosnika Osiori Beinhaus, is decorated with the bones of an estimated 40,000 human skeletons. The bones have been arranged in all sorts of forms and furnishings. The vaults are framed by great garlands of human skulls. There is a chandelier that is said to contain at least one example of every single bone in the human body. There are coats of arms, literally. How did this come about? It may look as if it's the legacy of some bloodthirsty medieval count, a memento left behind by Vlad the Impaler or his ilk. But the truth is a simple case of overcrowding. After a 13th century abbot returned from the Holy Land with soil from Golgotha, which he sprinkled over the cemetery, the site became the most desirable graveyard around. Many skeletons were exhumed to make room, 
and the resulting pile of bones was eventually put to ornamental use by the monks. Today, Sedlik has turned its most infamous place into a tourist destination. It even has a gift shop, so that those of a macabre bent can bone up on a little history themselves. Eight seven five South Bundy Drive, Brentwood, Los Angeles. This was the home where, on the twelfth of June, nineteen ninety-four, Nicole Brand Simpson was found murdered, along with her friend Ronald Goldman. Goldman was on a visit to return Nicole's mother's sunglasses, which had been left in the restaurant where he worked. Nicole's ex-husband, football legend, sports commentator, and sometime movie star Oranthal James Simpson, known to the world as O.J., was arrested and tried for the two murders but not before a slow speed police chase of Simpson on Interstate 405, following his failure to turn himself in and the release of a letter he wrote to the media denying involvement in the crimes, but suggesting he was considering suicide. Four days after the chase, Simpson appeared in court for his arraignment and pleaded not guilty to the two murders. The following trial lasted for nine months and attracted so much global publicity that it was dubbed the trial of the century. The court case made many of the people involved in it familiar figures. The judge, Lance Ito, found himself the subject of television comedy parodies. Prosecutor Marsha Clark and leading member of the defense team, Johnny Cochran, also found themselves in the spotlight. Although there was a great deal of DNA evidence against Simpson, in the end it seemed as if the prosecution's case rested on its ill-advised choice of having Simpson try on one of the blood-soaked gloves implicated in the murders. Perhaps it had shrunk due to the blood or following a freezing and thawing process. Perhaps it is true that Simpson had stopped taking arthritis medication, resulting in a swelling of his joints. Or maybe he simply wasn't guilty. Whatever the reason, the glove clearly did not fit, and the jury took only three hours of deliberation before acquitting him on both charges. Amidst talk of a racially charged issue, mishandling by the prosecution, and a stunned reaction from relatives of the murder victims, Simpson walked away a free man. As to count one, is this your verdict? Any reaction? No comments. However, no comments. in February 1997, the case took an even more bizarre turn when a civil jury in Santa Monica found Simpson guilty of the wrongful death of Goldman, as well as battery against both Goldman and Nicole Simpson and the file is still not closed. A body of evidence now suggests Simpson's son Jason from his first marriage was the real murderer. He was 24 at the time of the murders and had a history of rage-filled psychotic episodes. And controversy flared again when Simpson attempted to publish a book called If I Did It in 2006, another twist in the long and tawdry drama surrounding the murders at South Bundy Drive. In 1936, Germany's Reich Air Ministry paid the town of Volgast 750,000 Reichsmarks for the exclusive use of a large area of land near the mouth of the Pina River on the Baltic coast. Two years later, it had nearly completed a facility, which included an army research center and a Luftwaffe test site. The Hiefersversuchstelle Pina Munda, abbreviated as HVP, became one of five military proving grounds and the site for the development of several World War II guided missiles. The most notorious was the world's first operational liquid fuel rocket, the V-2, known to its designers as the A-4. The V-2 rocket was the progenitor of all modern rockets and a direct forerunner of the Saturn V moon rocket. It was the first ballistic missile and the first man-made object launched into space. It also took an extraordinary amount of testing to get right. When finally used against the Allies in World War II, V-2 rockets were responsible for the deaths of around 7,000 people. But 20,000 had died during construction of them. Most of those were slave labor workers from the Mittelbau Dora concentration camp. As Roy Irons pointed out in his book, Hitler's Terror Weapons, however, by 1943, the Germans were doing so badly in the war that Hitler was determined to press on with testing the weapon in order to build German morale and show his troops the war was still winnable. But still the testing gave rise to embarrassments and mistakes. In April 1943, the commander of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, came to Pinamunda with the intention of taking control of the research and development program in order to expand his power base. But before he could indulge in the inevitable power play with the leaders of the program, Walter Dornberger and Werner von Braun, a faulty test saw one of the rockets land on Himmler's own plane, 
and it was back to the drawing board for the rocket once again. From the original missile design to the day the V2s were finally put into production, 65,000 changes were made. In August 1943, the Allied forces bombed Pinamunda, causing disruption and the loss of several months of development. The main production of V2s was moved to the underground Mittelwerk factory near Nordhausen. War shortages also had an effect. Testing had begun in March 1942, but unexplained in-flight disintegrations resulted in an 80% failure rate. There was a veritable litany of errors, such as rockets exploding at liftoff, noses breaking off, and steam generators misbehaving. But still the Germans persevered, realizing that if they could get the V2 to work, its supersonic and therefore silent flight would make it a formidable weapon. One that, unlike its predecessor, the V1 flying bomb or the doodlebug, would give no warning to unsuspecting targets. And on the 3rd of October, 1942, they finally got it right with the V2's first successful flight. Just over 6,000 V2s were built, and as many as 3,225 were launched against Allied territory, beginning in September 1944, with attacks on the recently liberated Paris. Other targets included Belgium, England, and the Netherlands, with Antwerp and London being the hardest hit. Around 2,700 civilians were killed in London, with the last British civilian to die being 34-year-old Mrs. Ivy Millerchamp at her home in Orpington. Despite this, overall, the V2 lacked effectiveness. Its guidance systems weren't sophisticated enough. At two billion US dollars, the program was extremely expensive. And basically, it all came too late. What the program did do, though, was to lay the foundations for the space race that would take off only a few short years later. At just after seven o'clock, on the evening of the 21st of December, 1988, a bomb exploded on Pan Am Flight 103, a Boeing 747-121 named Clippermaid of the Sea. The aeroplane had taken off from Heathrow Airport and was en route for JFK in New York. But the 450 grams of plastic explosive detonated in the forward cargo hold, completely destroying the plane. Victims and debris were scattered over a huge stretch of southwest Scotland with both wings and some of the fuselage landing on Sherwood Crescent in the small town of Lockerbie. Everyone on board was killed, as well as 11 people on the ground. In 2001, Libyan intelligence officer Abdel Basset Ali Mohamed al Magrahi was jailed for life for the planting of the bomb, although he has always claimed his innocence. In a city full of recognizable landmarks, the Tower of London still stands out as one of the most historical and fascinating buildings in the English capital. Situated on the north bank of the River Thames, not far from Tower Bridge, its full title is Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress, the Tower of London. The most familiar part of the building is the original White Tower, the square fortress constructed by William the Conqueror in 1078. Today, the tower is first and foremost a tourist destination, famous for its yeoman warders, or beef eaters. They have patrolled the grounds since 1485, when first installed as Henry VII's bodyguards. Now, while they officially protect the crown jewels, they mostly serve as guides to the thousands of tourists who visit the tower every year. In 2007, the first ever female beef eater, Moira Cameron, joined their ranks. But the tower wasn't always such a jolly place to be. On the contrary, it has a long and often macabre history. Its original use was as a fortress, palace, and prison, particularly for high-profile or religious captives. The tower was used as a residence by such monarchs as Richard the Lionheart, Henry III, and Edward I. It was Henry who made it a significant royal palace and constructed palatial buildings inside the inner bailey. It remained a royal dwelling until the time of Oliver Cromwell in the 1650s. Its most infamous use, however, was as a prison and place of torture and execution. The roll call of those beheaded in its grounds includes two wives of Henry VIII, Catherine Howard and Anne Boleyn. The latter's ghost is said to walk around the tower with her head tucked underneath her arm. 
Other famous captives included Sir Walter Raleigh, Guy Fawkes, and even Queen Elizabeth I, who was held for a couple of months in 1554 on suspicion of being involved in Wyatt's rebellion. The tower also housed an armory and torture chambers, which boasted such charming implements as the scavenger's daughter, a sort of compression instrument, and the Duke of Exeter's daughter, or more simply, the rack. And while they may not have been acquainted with either of these two horrific daughters, the princes in the tower almost certainly suffered within its walls. Placed there by their uncle Richard III, the two young sons of Edward IV were declared illegitimate by an act of parliament, and then simply never heard of again. Many presume them to have been murdered on Richard's orders, but it seems now the truth will never be known. Another famous murder victim was Henry VI of England. Imprisoned in the tower, he was found dead in May 1471. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, has long been suspected of the dastardly deed. The tower was also home to a menagerie, established in the 13th century and boasting a number of big cats such as leopards and lions. The menagerie lasted until 1835, when the last of the animals were transferred to London Zoo in Regent's Park. The only animals left are the famous ravens. The legend has it that the tower, the monarchy and the entire kingdom would fall if they ever left. No wonder then that one of the Beefeater's most serious duties today is to make sure that those birds are extremely well looked after. Does the name Bucks Row mean anything to you? How about the name of the person most commonly associated with it, Jack the Ripper? This is Whitechapel, the area in the East End of London where a number of women working as prostitutes were mutilated and murdered in the latter half of 1888. To this day, there remains much debate about not only who Jack the Ripper really was, but which of the women in the Whitechapel murders were actually his victims. Out of the 11 or so bodies, though, there is a group called the Canonical Five. Mary Ann Nichols, nicknamed Polly, was the first of these, killed on the 31st of August, 1888. Her body was discovered in the early hours of the morning on Bucks Row. Bucks Row, which has since been renamed Derwood Street, was a back alley in Whitechapel, a couple of hundred metres away from the London Hospital. Some of the original buildings and brickwork still exist today, including the low brick wall stretching east from the board school, where Polly's body was found. For those of a strong disposition, you can still trace the Ripper's steps today, with various guided tours and excursions around the sites of the murders. Number two of the canonical five was Annie Chapman, who also had a nickname, Dark Annie. She was found on the 8th of September, dead in a backyard in Spitalfields, with her uterus removed. Throughout the police investigation, a huge number of letters were sent to the police. Most of them were declared hoaxes, but there were a handful that the police took more seriously. The first of these was the Dear Boss letter, received on the 29th of September. It was the first time the serial killer signed himself Jack the Ripper, and also referred to clipping a lady's ears off, which rang alarm bells the very next day. The 30th of September was the day that became known as the double event, because within the space of 24 hours, two mutilated bodies were discovered by police. Victim number three was Elizabeth Stride, also known as Long Liz. The Swedish-born 43-year-old was found in the early hours in Dutfield's yard off Burner Street. Like Bucks Row, Burner Street was also renamed to play down the ghoulish connotations. Catherine Eddowes was a bit different. Her body was found outside of Whitechapel, in Mitre Square in the city of London. This was the furthest west of all the murders, and the fact that she was found on the same day as Elizabeth Stride has made some ripperologists, as those who study the case are called, claim her murder as proof that there wasn't just one ripper, but at least two killers at large at the same time. It was Eddowes' corpse, however, that persuaded the police that the Dear Boss letter was probably genuine. As well as missing a uterus and a kidney, she was found with one ear severed. It was this kind of mutilation that led people to suspect that the killer may be a surgeon or a butcher. The next missive attributed to the killer was the Saucy Jack postcard, which was delivered on the 1st of October and referred to both ear removal and the so-called double event of the previous day. Those details were already known by journalists, however, and so the card could still have been a hoax. With such widespread publicity and reporting of the murders, citizens were understandably nervous. And one of them, George Lusk, led the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee to patrol the streets at night. 
It was to Lusk that the next letter was addressed. It is widely thought to be the most probably authentic epistle, largely because it arrived accompanied by a box containing half a human kidney preserved in alcohol. The writer made a gruesome claim about the other half. I fried and ate it, the letter said. It was very nice. The last of the canonical five was Mary Jane Kelly, nicknamed Ginger. She was the only one of them found indoors, discovered on the bed in her single room at Miller's Court in Spitalfields. Her corpse was the most mutilated so far, with her heart being completely removed and many other internal organs taken out of her body and left around the room. Even with contemporary technology, we are still no closer to solving the mystery, and the list of possible suspects seems only to grow as the years go by. Will we ever know the truth? Fidel Castro came to power in Cuba in 1959, having led the revolution which overthrew the dictator Batista. Castro's close ties with the Soviet Union made the United States very nervous. Following covert attempts to topple Castro, an economic embargo, and the failure of the US-backed Bay of Pigs invasion by Cuban exiles in April 1961, this mistrust and unease led to a terrifying standoff later that year. It became known to the Russians as the Caribbean crisis, to the Cubans as the October crisis, and to the US and its allies as the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest the world has ever come to nuclear war. Tensions rose when the United States deployed 15 Jupiter nuclear missiles in Turkey. A Jupiter's range of 1,500 miles meant that they were a direct threat to Moscow. The Russians reacted immediately, and US reconnaissance planes sent out on the 14th of October spotted missile launching sites being constructed in Cuba. The incriminating photographs were shown to the new president, John F. Kennedy, who had succeeded Eisenhower in January. The escalating crisis soon became a baptism of fire for the 44-year-old president. Kennedy called a meeting of the executive committee of the National Security Council. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, where they found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. Eschewing a surgical airstrike and resisting pressure from the Joint Chiefs of Staff for an all-out invasion, Kennedy decided that the best course of action was a naval blockade of Cuba. Although for reasons of international law, the term quarantine was used instead of blockade. Over the next few days, the Russians, via diplomat Andrei Gromyko, continued to deny the presence of any missiles in Cuba. But the U-2 reconnaissance planes reported that four Cuban sites were not only built, but fully operational. The Soviet Union's president, Nikita Khrushchev, labeled the quarantine an act of aggression. And amidst no let-up in the work on the missile sites, the Cubans prepared themselves for a US invasion. By the 25th of October, the crisis was at a head, with the US at defense readiness condition, DEFCON 2, for the first time in history, and the Soviets showing no signs of backing down. By the 27th of October, Castro was ready to fight, and he drafted a letter to Khrushchev calling for a preemptive strike on the United States. He also issued a directive that all Cuban anti-aircraft weapons should fire on any US aircraft. Previously, that order was only for groups of two or more aircraft. Khrushchev, however, remained calm, and the next morning he broadcast a message on Radio Moscow, offering a new solution to the crisis. Khrushchev promised to remove the Cuban missiles if the Americans agreed to remove the Jupiters from Turkey, despite Turkey's continued insistence that they wanted the missiles to stay. During the next XCOM meeting, President Kennedy pushed for an agreement to Khrushchev's proposal, but his advisers were against it as they thought it would undermine NATO and Turkey. Around midday on the 27th, a US Lockheed U-2 plane was shot down in Cuba, adding to the tension. But Kennedy, despite earlier promising to launch an attack if that happened, held tight. By the end of the day, the US had drafted a letter to the USSR suggesting that they remove the weapons system from Cuba in exchange for the US removing the naval quarantine and promising not to invade Cuba. No mention was made of Turkey, but there was an unofficial agreement that the weapons in Turkey would be voluntarily dismantled after the standoff was resolved. The Americans didn't really expect a positive response to their message, but after the intervention of the United Nations, at 9 a.m. on the 28th of October, Khrushchev aired another broadcast on Radio Moscow, agreeing to dismantle the Cuban missiles and return them to the Soviet Union. The crisis was over, although many believed that the result was a compromise. 
But considering how close the world got to all-out nuclear war, a few bruised egos were a very small price to pay, indeed. One of the most successful thefts in British history was the so-called Great Train Robbery. On the 8th of August, 1963, a gang of about 15 men held up the travelling post office train en route from Glasgow to London. Tampering with the signals at Sears Crossing, the robbers then took the uncoupled money train to Brideco Railway Bridge at Leadburn in Buckinghamshire. There, they stole around £2.6 million, the equivalent of about £40 million in today's money, and over eight times the amount usually carried on the train due to a Scottish bank holiday. The gang had no guns, a fact which accounts for the response to them from the British public. By some, the robbers were regarded almost affectionately, but the crime was not really a victimless one. The co-driver, David Whitby, was thrown down a railway embankment, and the driver, Jack Mills, was abducted before being hit over the head with an iron bar, causing trauma headaches for the rest of his life. An anonymous tip-off led to the arrests and imprisonment of 13 members of the gang. The most famous, Ronnie Biggs, escaped after 15 months and lived for many years in Australia and Brazil before returning home to England in 2001 at the age of 71, citing increasing ill health and mounting medical bills in Brazil. He was sent back to jail with 28 years of his sentence remaining. In July 2007, he was moved to Norwich prison on compassionate grounds. This is the Imola racetrack in Italy. In 2004, around 1,000 fans gathered there to mark the 10-year anniversary of the death of their hero, 34-year-old Brazilian racing driver Ayrton Senna da Silva. Even today, Senna is considered by some to be the greatest Formula One racing driver of all time. His achievements in the sport were outstanding. He won the World Championship three times and scored 65 pole positions in 162 races. He won the Monaco Grand Prix six times, five times consecutively between 1989 and 1993. This record still stands. Having parted company from the McLaren racing team in 1993, on the 1st of May of the following year, Senna lined up for his third race with the Williams Renault team at Imola. And as was so often the case, he began the race in pole position. But seven laps into the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix, Senna's vehicle broke traction twice at the rear, left the track at Tamburello Corner, and slammed into a concrete barrier at 218 kilometers per hour. Despite losing a wheel and the nose cone, the car didn't seem to have sustained much damage. But it soon became apparent that Senna's helmet was punctured at the top of the visor. It is thought that the tire and the attached piece of suspension had hit him, causing a fatal cranial trauma. His death was even more poignant, coming only one day after a crash had claimed the life of Austrian driver Roland Ratzenberger in practice at the same event. Senna had been greatly affected by Ratzenberger's death, which reinforced safety fears that already concerned him. He insisted on visiting the crash site to see what went wrong. And when his car was examined following his accident the next day, a blood-soaked Austrian flag was found inside. He had been intending to raise it as his victory flag in honor of Ratzenberger. As the news of his death spread, the Brazilian government declared three days of national mourning, and he was given a state funeral. It was the first death in a Formula One event for 12 years, and controversy surrounded the tragedy when it was suggested that in the two separate accidents, both he and Ratzenberger had died immediately, but had been kept on life support until away from the track so that the event wouldn't be abandoned in line with racing laws. More controversy loomed over the roadworthiness of the car itself, and for many years, the Williams team fought a manslaughter charge through the Italian courts. They were eventually found not guilty. Senna's driving prowess wasn't his only legacy, however. After his death, it was revealed that he had donated millions of dollars to children's charities and founded an institution to help the disadvantaged, which is still thriving today. For over 30 years, the TSMS Laconia had a varied and successful history as a passenger liner, troop carrier and cruise ship. On the 22nd of December 1963, she was 550 miles northwest of Casablanca and three days into an 11-day Christmas cruise. At about 11 p.m., a fire caused by faulty wiring started in the ship's hairdressing salon. It spread rapidly, but the order to abandon ship wasn't given until a couple of hours later. And despite the ship passing a safety inspection 24 hours before setting sail, 
there were serious safety issues overlooked. Many of the lifeboats were unusable due to rusted chains, and lockers containing life-saving equipment could not be opened. Other lifeboats burned before they could be launched, and one survivor later complained that the fire alarm was so weak it sounded like someone ringing a waiter for tea. Though many survivors were picked up, there was still a heavy loss of life. Out of the 1,022 people on board, a total of 128 died. A couple of days later, some tugboats began towing the badly damaged ship to Gibraltar. But on the 29th of December, she rolled over and sank in only three minutes. Clifton House, the Buckinghamshire mansion that in its time has been home to the Astor family and various dukes, but really earned its infamy in the early 60s when it became known as the place where cabinet minister John Profumo met topless showgirl Christine Keeler. There's nothing the great British public and the not so great British media like better than a sex scandal, a spy scandal or a political one. But when you get all three together, that's the best thing of all. And to this day, the Profumo affair is the one that people still talk about. Profumo met Keeler at a party organized by the society osteopath Stephen Ward and had a brief affair with her, despite being married to actress Valerie Hobson. Keeler was at the time close friends with Mandy Rice Davis, whose vivacity and ready wit brought an even greater spotlight on the affair. The scandal really developed when news of the affair spread, coupled with the revelation that Keeler was also seeing Yevgeny Ivanov, a naval attaché at the Soviet embassy. Considering Britain was in the middle of the Cold War, the security breach implications of this led to questions in the House of Commons, with Profumo compounding his disgrace by at first lying about the affair, saying there had been no impropriety whatsoever. When Profumo was finally forced to admit the truth, his position became untenable, and he resigned from the Cabinet on the 5th of June, 1963. The ripple effect spread to Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, who stepped down in October with deteriorating health. Stephen Ward was charged with living on the immoral earnings of prostitution and committed suicide in August, while Christine Keeler was sentenced to nine months in prison on unrelated perjury charges concerning another boyfriend, Aloysius Gordon, known as Lucky. Keeler kept a fairly low profile during the whole Profumo affair, although she did pose for photographer Lewis Morley. The resulting shot remains one of the most iconic British images of the 1960s. In 2001, she published her autobiography, The Truth at Last, John Profumo, having kept a promise never to talk about the scandal again, died in 2006, having finally restored his reputation after many years of charity work. Mandy Rice Davis, on the other hand, had plenty to say for herself. She was called to give evidence at Stephen Ward's trial, and when the prosecution remarked that Lord Astor denied any knowledge or relationship with her, she replied, well, he would, wouldn't he? The quote has since entered popular usage, especially amongst British politicians. In fact, it was probably Rice Davis who came out of the whole Profumo scandal the best. She traded on her notoriety, married a businessman from Israel, and went on to open a number of successful nightclubs and restaurants in Tel Aviv. She also released records and worked as an actress, even appearing in an episode of Absolutely Fabulous in 1994. Brixton, 1985. Toxteth, 1981. Notting Hill, 1958. The list of race riots in the UK is a long and inglorious one, but some are more memorable than others. The events of August and September 1958 in Notting Hill certainly stand out, but not quite so well remembered is that there was also trouble in the Midland city of Nottingham. It all seemed to begin on the 23rd of August in a pub in St Anne's Well Road, and is believed to have been sparked by outrage over interracial relationships, black men and white women. The roots of the tension were clearly much deeper than that, though, stretching back to the end of the post-war economic highs that had brought Caribbean immigrants to Britain in the first place. Dubbed by some the Teddy Boy Riots, after the visible presence of that particular working-class male subculture, the riots resulted in many stabbings and resurfaced a week later. This time, though, the largely white crowd turned on itself, leading to a brawl and many arrests. Meanwhile, events in Notting Hill in West London were focusing attention further south. Apparently triggered by an attack on a white Swedish woman married to a West Indian man, the riots and disturbances carried on for several nights. 
over 140 people were arrested and nine white men convicted of serious assault received four-year prison sentences in what became known as exemplary sentencing, harsh punishment intended to act as a deterrent. Six years later, Claudia Jones started the now world-famous Notting Hill Carnival as a response to the unrest and an attempt to improve the state of race relations in Britain. Nobody really knows why the man-eating lions of Savo behaved the way they did, although there are plenty of theories. Despite their appearances, these big cats were not lionesses, but male lions without manes. And some think that it was their unusually high levels of testosterone that both diminished their hair and considerably raised their levels of aggression. The lions were also much bigger than normal. The Savo beasts were reckoned to weigh 500 pounds and were 10 feet long. They also both had abscesses under their teeth, leading scientists to conclude that they were simply in too much pain to hunt and eat tougher prey. Or were the events of the late 19th century simply explained by an outbreak of rinderpest disease, a cattle plague which had wiped out much of the lion's usual prey? Local legends are more fanciful, however. It is believed by many that the lions were summoned by African shamans who didn't want the iron snake of the railway encroaching on their land. Whatever the reason, the two Savo man-eaters were able to terrorize Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson and his men as they attempted to build a bridge as part of the Uganda Railway over Savo River in Kenya from March 1898. Patterson only kept detailed records of the deaths of his skilled workers, not the indigenous Africans, so exact figures have been disputed. But by December of that year, around 135 workers had been dragged out of their tents and eaten. Patterson did everything he could to try and hunt down the animals, finally shooting the first lion on the 8th of December. The second was killed three weeks later. And as recently as 2000, museum staff at the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History came up with another theory to explain the lion's abnormal hunger for human flesh. They suggested that the lions had scavenged the graves of inadequately buried dead railway workers and moved from that to live sleeping people. Patterson's journals confirmed that burial mounds had been disturbed and bodies eaten. Whatever the truth, the man-eating lions of Savo have now taken on legendary status, leading to their appearance in books and such movies as The Ghost in the Darkness, starring Michael Douglas and Val Kilmer as Patterson. Of all the tragedies that have taken place in sporting arenas, one of the most ignominious would have to be the Heisel Stadium disaster of the 29th of May, 1985. This is for the simple reason that it was triggered not by an accident or an act of God, but by hooliganism. The occasion was the final of the European Cup. England's powerhouse team, Liverpool Football Club, were to play the top Italian team, Juventus, at the ageing Heisel Stadium in Brussels. With around 60,000 fans in attendance, the ground had been cordoned off to keep the fans of the opposing team separate. One section, however, had been reserved for neutral supporters, and with the tickets acquired by travel agents and touts, this resulted in a number of Juventus fans finding themselves in close proximity to their sworn enemies. With just a flimsy fence dividing them, the Liverpool supporters rushed the barrier an hour before kickoff. As the Juventus supporters scrambled to get away, they backed into a crumbling wall, which collapsed, killing 39 people and injuring hundreds more. There is confusion about whether the organizers and players knew exactly what had happened, but it was decided to continue with the game anyway to prevent further disturbances. Juventus won 1-0, thanks to a penalty by Michel Platini. After the match, policing and stadium concerns were ignored, with Liverpool receiving all the blame. The club was banned indefinitely from European competition, as were all other English clubs. The ban lasted for five years. This is the capital city of the Republic of Macedonia, which sits on the Vada River. In 1963, while it was still part of President Tito's Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, the city was hit, not for the first time, by a massive earthquake. It had already been nearly wiped out in 518 AD and again at the end of the 11th century. This time, the first tremor was felt at 5 a.m. on the morning of the 26th of July. It measured 6.1 on the Richter scale and killed more than 1,000 people. 80% of the city was destroyed and 120,000 citizens lost their homes. 
At the time, the population was only around 200,000 in total. Rescue teams from across Yugoslavia were swiftly mobilized, and a significant international relief fund meant that the city was quickly rebuilt. But many historical and cultural monuments were lost forever, as were elements of the city's Ottoman heritage. Today, next to a museum, the ruins of the old train station still stand, turned into a memorial for those that lost their lives in the quake. Saddam Hussein was by no means the first despot in Iraqi history. Baghdad's military past features a long line of dictators, coups and counter-coups. One of the bloodiest took place on the 8th of February 1963. It was a coup d'etat orchestrated by the Ba'athist party, which included Saddam, to topple President Abdul Karim Qasim. In the fighting, 5,000 Iraqis were killed, with the Ba'athists numbering their own losses at 80. The motivation for overthrowing Qasim was suspected to be pan-Arabist influence and state control over oil. It was carried out with the backing of the American CIA and the British government and resulted in a house-to-house -house hunt for members of the Communist Party. Ironically, Qasim himself had come to power only five years earlier in another coup. On the 14th of July 1958, he and his adherents had seized military control over the Iraqi capital, overthrowing the monarchy and executing several members of the royal family. By 1963, he had withdrawn the country from the pro-Western Baghdad Pact, lifted the ban on the Communist Party, and established relationships with the Soviet Union. Moves like seizing 98% of Iraqi land from the British-owned Iraq Petroleum Company served to increase Western hostility. The CIA was so keen to see him removed, it joined forces with a small but militant Ba'athist party to plot Qasim's downfall. Foreshadowing Saddam Hussein's own demise 43 years later, Qasim was executed after a show trial on the 9th of February, 1963. The Democratic Republic of Congo, like many other former colonies, faced a long period of political instability and complicated maneuverings following its independence from its old colonizers, Belgium, in 1960. The next five years became known as the Congo Crisis, with the establishment of the First Republic ushering in a period of turmoil, which had various elements. To begin with, there was the anti-colonial struggle, compounded by yet another displaced Cold War battle, with the United States and the Soviet Union becoming involved. There were also successionist battles, particularly in the province of Katanga. Katanga was one of the richest areas of the Congo, with copper, gold and uranium mines. It was led by Moise Shombe, who declared independence from the rest of the country on the 11th of July, 1960. With much of these mineral resources under the control of Belgian industrial companies, the Belgian government supported the bid for independence, helping the police force to become militarized and sending troops. And at the center of the Katanga fighting forces were several hundred European mercenaries, many of them Belgian nationals. Eventually, the United Nations became involved, establishing a peacekeeping force in the area after its Security Council Resolution 143 of July 1960, which asked the Belgian government to remove its forces from the territory. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Dag Hammarskjöld, set up a UN force which remained in the Congo until 1964. At its peak, it numbered nearly 20,000, but the soldiers' blue helmets were a sign that they were there to keep the peace and could only use arms in self-defense. The first UN troops arrived in Katanga in mid-July, and by September, the Belgian troops had all withdrawn. But not before Hammarskjöld had tried to intervene personally, only to be killed in a plane crash en route to the trouble spot. His death came in the middle of Operation Mortha, launched by the UN on the 9th of September, when it became clear that Chambé's mercenaries were still in control of the gendarmerie. The operation went badly for the UN, amidst claims that it still had no official mandate to do anything but keep the peace. The fighting dragged on in Katanga until December 1962, when the UN initiated Operation Grand Slam, which proved decisive. By 1963, the capital city Elizabethville was under UN control, and the bid for independence was over. When an entire country becomes associated with an epithet like the killing fields, it certainly warrants inclusion in any list of infamous places. This was the term used to describe the mass grave sites of Cambodia in the late 1970s. Officially renamed as the Democratic Kampuchea, the country under the rule of the Khmer Rouge was a very grim place indeed. The Khmer Rouge was a radical political regime that formulated its doctrines throughout the 1960s in Vietnamese border camps. 
It believed that rural peasant farmers were the true working class proletarians and the backbone of the revolution. After a prolonged period of increasing their control over the rest of the country, the Khmer Rouge eventually captured the capital Phnom Penh on the 17th of April 1975, with Saloth Tsar officially becoming prime minister in May. Saloth Tsar is better known as Pol Pot. Once in power, Pol Pot could continue the doctrines that eventually saw between 1.7 and 2 million Cambodians exterminated, out of a population of only 7 million. Pol Pot promoted the idea of a primitivist agrarian future. This included a radical policy of relocation, with cities emptied and dissidents forcibly re-educated or disposed of in mass graves they were forced to dig themselves. The most well-known of the killing fields is Choang Ek. It now houses a Buddhist memorial to the genocide. The Khmer Rouge was eventually brought down following an invasion by Vietnam in 1979. The movement was not destroyed though, with Vietnam using their existence as an excuse to retain its military presence in Cambodia, and Khmer Rouge representatives retaining their seats at the United Nations. Pol Pot fled and lived in the woods on the Thai border, before finally dying in controversial circumstances on the 15th of April 1998. He was never brought to justice for his actions. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. These are the opening lines of the Gettysburg Address, one of the most famous and oft-quoted speeches in American history. Delivered by President Abraham Lincoln on the 19th of November 1863 and outlining the ethos at the heart of the American Civil War, namely the abolition of slavery. The speech was given four and a half months after the clash from which it took its name, the Battle of Gettysburg. The battle lasted for three days, from the 1st to the 3rd of July, 1863, and is generally regarded as the turning point of the four-year war. The Confederate troops of the southern states were led by General Robert E. Lee, and having recently won an important victory at Chancellorsville, they were ready to resume their second attempt at a march north, hoping to make it as far as Harrisburg in Pennsylvania, or even Philadelphia. But first, they had to get through a little town called Gettysburg. Located eight miles to the east of South Mountain, with Marsh Creek to its southwest and Rock Creek to its southeast, Gettysburg became a borough in the early 1800s. By the time the Civil War broke out, its population was around 2,400. As General Lee reached the town, President Lincoln urged Major General Joseph Hooker and the Union Army to follow closely behind. Before the battle could commence, though, Hooker was relieved of his command, and it was Major General George Gordon Meade and the Union's Army of the Potomac who resisted Lee's attacks. The Confederates took the offensive, and on the first day they attacked some ridges to the northwest of the town. The Union's defense lines rallied, but were swiftly overcome by two hefty contingents of Confederate troops orchestrated from Lee's headquarters. The Union troops retreated, scattering through the streets of the town. But that was just day one. By the 2nd of July, with most of both armies now ready for action, Meade put his defensive strategy into play. More heavy Confederate assaults triggered fierce battles at places like Little Round Top, the Wheatfield, Devil's Den, the Peach Orchard, and, fittingly, Cemetery Hill. Overnight, the troops began to count their losses before resuming their positions the next day. Again, Lee's forces led attacks to the east and south, but the major skirmish was at Cemetery Ridge, where, against the advice of the commander, Lieutenant General James Longstreet, 12,500 Confederates took part in the ill-fated Pickett's Charge. Major General George Pickett was one of the divisional commanders, and it was his fresh troops who were earmarked to lead the assault. The attack was a disaster, with Union defenses holding firm and the Confederates sustaining terrible losses. It was the turning point of the battle, and indeed the war, with Lee forced to abandon his invasion of the North and make a long, painful retreat to Virginia. The final figures for the three-day battle make grim reading. In just three days, the two armies suffered between 46,000 and 51,000 casualties, with over 7,860 deaths. Although the numbers of dead, wounded and captured were fairly equal on both sides, it was the Union's superior strength nearly 94,000 men compared to the Confederate's 71,700 that led to the Southerners' defeat. Marking the difference between the hand-to-hand -hand and artillery-led warfare of the 1800s and the all-out attacks of today with their overwhelming so-called collateral damage, there was just one documented civilian death during the battles. A 20-year-old local woman called Ginny Wade died when a stray bullet went through her window. As the armies left Gettysburg, the town was left with the cleanup operation. 
All those corpses were left on the ground in the hot summer sun and had to be buried swiftly. Then there were the 3,000 horse carcasses, which were burned to the south of the town, resulting in such a revolting stench that some townsfolk became ill. The debris was so extensive that Gettysburg still displayed the ravages of the fighting four months later, when President Lincoln arrived to dedicate the soldiers' national cemetery and deliver his historic address. It ended with the memorable lines, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. At about half past six on the night of the 6th of March, 1987, the unthinkable happened to the British car ferry, the Herald of Free Enterprise. Having just left the Belgian port of Bruges-Zeebrugge for Dover in England, she was only 90 metres from shore when she capsized, leading to the deaths of 193 passengers and crew. The seven-year-old ferry was a roll-on, roll-off craft, which meant it had doors at both the bow and the stern. And it soon became apparent that through oversight and negligence, she had left the harbour with the bow doors still open. Only a minute and a half into the voyage, at a speed of just under 19 knots, water began to pour into the car deck. This caused the ship to list to port before righting herself and then listing again. This time she went right over, ending up half submerged in the shallow water. With the electrical systems flooded, the ship was plunged into darkness, but a nearby dredger saw the lights go out and raised the alarm. Help began arriving within half an hour, but unfortunately the three degrees Celsius water meant that many of the victims trapped in the ship died due to hypothermia. It was later discovered that the crew member responsible for shutting the doors had gone on a break and was asleep. Nor was the first officer on the car deck as the ship set sail, as he was trying to keep to a tight schedule. And the captain was not able to see that the doors were still open. An inquiry into the disaster found that there was a disease of sloppiness throughout the Townsend Torres and Company. It was also noted, however, that ferries had sailed with open doors before, without sinking. But there were other contributing factors here to do with the pressure created by the ship in the shallow water, the height of the bow doors, and the speed at which the vessel was traveling. But even with all these factors, disaster could still have been averted if the ship had been divided into watertight compartments and not featured an open car deck. This facilitated easy loading and unloading of vehicles, but also meant that the entire car deck was flooded, leading to the ship capsizing when she turned. In October 1987, a coroner's inquest jury returned a verdict of unlawful killing and many people involved were prosecuted for manslaughter, as was the operating company, P&O European Ferries. And since the accident, there have been design improvements made to this type of ferry, including switches on the bridge displaying the status of the bow doors, watertight ramps fitted to the bow sections, and freeing flaps which let water escape from the car deck in case of flood. This was all too late for the Herald of Free Enterprise, though, which was raised and made one last voyage to India, where she was dismantled in 1988. Galloping Gertie was the nickname given to the first attempt at building a bridge to carry Washington State Route 16 across the Tacoma Narrows in Washington State. It was opened to traffic on the 1st of July 1940 and quickly earned its descriptive moniker for the way it moved in the wind. As is so often the case, the problem was one of funding. Plans for the bridge had kicked off in earnest in 1937 when the Washington State Toll Bridge Authority came into being and took control of $5,000 for a feasibility study into building a suspension bridge. But when the authority applied to the Public Works Administration for $11 million to build a design by local engineer Clark Eldridge, a New York company said they could do it for less. The new design featured two and a half meter girder supports beneath the roadway instead of the original seven and a half meter ones. This decision was to prove disastrous. And at 11 a.m. on the 7th of November, just four months after opening, events showed just how disastrous. A physical phenomenon known as mechanical resonance made the bridge swing violently from side to side before the concrete cracked and the bridge's central span plunged into the narrows below. Amazingly, there was no human loss of life in the incident, although there was one death, a cocker spaniel called Tubby, who got trapped in a car when his owner's father, local news photographer Leonard Coatsworth, was forced to flee for his life. Coatsworth later received compensation of $364.40 for his car contents, including poor old Tubby. On the evening of Sunday the 5th of November 1967, 
the 743 express commuter train was travelling from Hastings to Charing Cross when it came off the rails between Hither Green and Grove Park railway stations, shortly before the St Mildred's Road railway bridge in south-east London. It was a quarter past nine. The train was travelling at approximately 70 miles per hour in heavy rain, when the front wheels of the third coach hit a wedge-shaped piece of steel that had broken away from the track, derailing the coach. The train continued on in this way for about a mile, however, before the derailed wheels hit the crossover lead of a diamond crossing in the up fast line. The third coach, the one ahead of it, and all the coaches behind were affected. The coupling broke behind the leading coach, which ran forward and finally stopped some 200 metres away from the second coach and 700 metres short of Hithergreen Station. Of the ten carriages that came off the tracks, one overturned completely and another two jackknifed onto their sides. Two of the carriages had their sides totally ripped off. Being a Sunday evening, the train was packed with people travelling back into the city and the carriages and corridors were full. 49 people died in the accident and nearly 80 were injured, 27 seriously. The rain and darkness meant that the rescue workers had a particularly difficult task, working under floodlights to try and free survivors. Two of the more well-known of these were Robin Gibb of the pop group The Bee Gees and Molly Hullis. Following their narrow escape, the couple married the next year. Poignantly, the derailment occurred only a month before the 10-year anniversary of the Lewisham train crash, which took place just over a mile away and resulted in 90 fatalities. Investigators looking into the crash found that a triangular piece of the track had come away, leaving a gap. It was believed that the gap had, however, been successfully negotiated by previous trains on the busy track. The running off sleeper had failed before, and the replacement was a shallow timber one. It had not been well packed. The running on rail was supported by a concrete sleeper, which gave it very rigid support, leading to severe stress on the rail as successive trains struck it. But the 743 had a special suspension fitted in order to limit the sway of bodies, as there were tight clearances in the tunnels on its regular Tunbridge-Hastings route. This caused very high wheel forces at any track irregularities, which probably explains why this train derailed when others didn't. It was also noted that the speed limit on this section of the railway had been raised from 75 to 90 miles per hour a few months previously, and it was thought that, accordingly, available resources for basic track maintenance had simply become overwhelmed. The accident resulted in the speeding up of the introduction of continuous welded rail, the banning of concrete sleepers at rail joints on the southern region, and also the upgrading of maintenance standards in line with the increased wear caused by faster, heavier trains on the tracks. For the many people who are afraid of flying, it's what happens once the aeroplane is in the air that causes them the most apprehension. But there are times when what happens to the plane while it is still on the runway can be just as deadly. Like the horrific events of the 27th of March 1977 at Los Rodeos Airport on Tenerife in the Canary Islands. In thick fog and following a litany of mishaps and ill-timed occurrences, two Boeing 747s collided with each other killing 583 people. The accident was mostly caused by the crew of the KLM Royal Dutch Airlines Flight 4805, who were accidentally taking off without clearance and crashed into Pan American World Airways Flight 1736, which was taxiing along the same runway. Both planes were only at the airport because they had been diverted from Las Palmas due to a bomb explosion. Simultaneous radio messages cancelled each other out, and non-standard language was used between the cockpits and the control tower. After the crash, important changes were made to international regulations, including strict requirements for standard phrases and an emphasis on English as the common working language. Originally built in Hyde Park to showcase the Great Exhibition of 1851, the Crystal Palace was eventually moved to a suburb of London now known as Upper Norwood, where between 1854 and 1936, it became a popular destination for thousands of Victorian pleasure seekers. After its move from Hyde Park, the huge wrought iron and glass edifice wound up being about 560 metres in length and around 50 metres high. It was created by Joseph Paxton, who received a knighthood for his efforts. For many years, the palace was a great attraction, with its exhibitions of arts and crafts or dinosaurs, its firework displays, balloon launches, its fountains and trees, and grand events such as a three-day festival of Handel's music. Queen Victoria herself called the place enchanting. 
But during the Depression, diminishing ticket sales led to poor maintenance, and the final nail in its coffin was the fire which ravaged the building on the night of the 30th of November, 1936. Around 6 p.m., the manager, Henry Buckland, saw a red glow in a staff lavatory. He called workmen and went back to his duties, but within five minutes, the building was ablaze. 381 firefighters using 89 engines battled the flames, but to no avail. Rumors of arson spread, but it seems likely it was all just a tragic accident. And just as with a smaller, earlier fire in 1866, there wasn't sufficient insurance to cover the costs of rebuilding. The destruction of the South Tower meant the loss of much of the pioneering work of John Logie Baird, who had been conducting television experiments there. The only parts left standing were the two mighty water towers constructed by the great Victorian engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. These two were dismantled in the Second World War because of fears the Germans could use them to navigate their way to London. And as the fire destroyed London's favorite playground, the future prime minister, Winston Churchill, pronounced, this is the end of an age. The world's worst offshore oil disaster to date took place on a North Sea oil production platform called Piper Alpha on the 6th of July, 1988. On that date, an explosion and fire took the lives of 167 men out of the 229 on board at the time. The oil rig was operated by Occidental Petroleum and began production 12 years before that, drilling for oil initially and peaking at 300,000 barrels per day, but then focusing on its new gas recovery module from around 1980. The conversion from oil to gas was partly responsible for the high number of casualties, as the previous safety precautions of having the most dangerous areas as far away from personnel as possible were overridden, with examples like the gas compression area being situated right next to the control room. The chain of events on the night of the 6th of July began with maintenance work on a pressure relief valve on one of the two huge gas compressors. Communication between shifts was faulty, meaning that when compressor B failed later that evening, Operators were unaware that compressor A should not have been activated. The resulting explosion destroyed the control room, which was then abandoned. This meant that there was no one in command able to coordinate an evacuation. Two men donned protective gear and attempted to access the system manually, but were never seen again. As fire spread throughout the platform, it prevented personnel from gathering at lifeboat stations. Instead, they waited for instructions that never came in the fireproofed accommodation block until the acrid smoke began to filter in and escape became impossible. Even so, the fire would have burned itself out had it not been for the two other platforms, Tartan and Claymore. Lacking the authority to cease operations, even though they could see what was happening, they continued pumping oil through to Piper Alpha, leading to ruptured gas lines, further explosions and a devastating loss of life. Eventually, the fire was extinguished by the renowned American firefighter Red Adair, who, struggling against 80 mile an hour winds and 25 meter waves, took three weeks to control the fires, pumping cement into the wells and then capping them. This is Aberfan, a small coal mining village about eight kilometers south of Merthyr Tydfil in South Wales. And this was the Panklas Junior School. In 1966, it was led by headmistress Anne Jennings and her 10 teachers. There were 240 pupils. On Friday the 21st of October that year, at about 9.15 in the morning, just after the children had finished singing All Things Bright and Beautiful at assembly and were heading for their classrooms, waste tip number seven of the local colliery had collapsed, slid down Merthyr Mountain and engulfed the school, 20 houses and a farm. The timing couldn't have been worse. Had the children left the assembly hall just a few minutes later, the loss of life would have been greatly reduced as the classrooms were on the side of the building closest to the slag heap. At the same time, 50 children heading for the school by bus from nearby Mount Pleasant were fortunately held up by fog. This same fog initially hampered rescue efforts considerably. But as up to 2,000 volunteers, police, miners and other emergency workers dug frantically for survivors, the extent of the tragedy soon became apparent. Only a few people were pulled from the rubble alive but 144 bodies were eventually recovered, 116 of them children, mostly aged between seven and 10. The main causes of death were found to be asphyxia, fractured skulls, and multiple crush injuries. Five teachers were among the dead, including the deputy headmaster, Mr. Benyon, who was found clutching five children in his arms as if trying to protect them. Three of the dead were in the farm that was hit by the coal waste and slurry, 
and a pregnant woman immediately went into labor on hearing that her son was dead. Just over a week after the disaster, and after the last bodies had been recovered, the Queen and Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, visited Aberfan to pay their respects. A three-year-old girl presented the Queen with a posy on which it said, from the remaining children of Aberfan. Witnesses reported the Queen being close to tears. One person who didn't hurry to visit, though, was Lord Robins of Waldingham, who at the time was chairman of the National Coal Board. He instead decided to attend the University of Surrey, accepting an appointment as Chancellor. Robins and the NCB tried to blame the disaster on the heavy rains that had fallen in the days before the tragedy. But a tribunal of inquiry thought differently. It found the NCB to be totally responsible due to ignorance, ineptitude, and a failure of communication. But not a single NCB employee was sacked, demoted, or even disciplined. The slag heap had been built on a stream in the first place, and its instability was known to the mine's management and the tip workers. But nothing had been done about it. The local borough council and the National Union of Miners were both completely exonerated. Most shocking of all, on the orders of Harold Wilson's Labour government, part of a massive relief fund coordinated by the mayor and collected from all over the world was appropriated to make the remaining slag heaps safe. Families suffered the unbelievable indignity of being means tested by the Charities Commission as to the closeness of their relationship with their dead child. Compensation was to be rated accordingly. The NCB tried to pay £50 for each child, but was ordered to pay £500. In 1997, Tony Blair's new Labour government paid back the £150,000 that had been taken from the disaster fund. This amount ignored inflation, of course. The adjusted figure should have been in the realm of £1.5 million. But finally, in February 2007, over 40 years after the horrific events at Aberfan, the sum of £2 million was awarded to the village to help local schools and to secure the upkeep of the memorial garden and the cemetery. This is a Union Carbide subsidiary plant in Bhopal, a central Indian city with a population of just under one and a half million. The name Bhopal gained notoriety across the globe after the 3rd of December 1984, when the pesticide plant accidentally released 40 tonnes of a lethal gas called methyl isocyanate, or MIC. Nearly 3,000 people were killed immediately, with thousands more affected. To this day, up to 22,000 deaths are believed to have been caused by the disaster, which has come to be regarded as the world's worst industrial accident. Over 120,000 people continue to suffer from such things as cancer, serious birth defects, blindness, breathing difficulties, and various gynecological complications. The immediate cause of most of the deaths and injuries was pulmonary edema, a swelling or fluid accumulation in the lungs. So how did it happen? The plant was built in 1969, before being adapted 10 years later to produce carbaryl, used mostly as an insecticide. MIC is an intermediate used in the manufacture of carbaryl. The actual cause of the accident was the introduction of water into a methyl isocyanide holding tank, which resulted in a huge temperature increase to over 200 degrees Celsius. The toxic gas produced led to a pressure release in the form of an explosion. But how the water got in the tank is another story. It seems, as is so often the case, that cost-cutting was one of the chief culprits. Before the plant was even built, cost was cited as Union Carbide's refusal to locate it far away from densely populated areas, as local authorities requested. And from 1982 onward, there was a long litany of cost-cutting shortcuts and safety violations made at the plant in response to falling profitability from decreased sales of pesticides. Just one example of the widespread malpractice is that 70% of the plant's employees were fined prior to the disaster for refusing to deviate from the proper safety regulations, despite pressure from management. When confronted with the disaster, though, the response from Union Carbide management was that the incident was caused by deliberate sabotage, a claim that has never been substantiated. Nor has anyone ever been prosecuted or even publicly named for such an act. Unlike Union Carbide's company chairman, Warren Anderson, who was charged with manslaughter but escaped to the US. He has since been living comfortably in the Hamptons. Years of legal wranglings followed the disaster, but other issues have also arisen, particularly ongoing health problems and contamination of the area. When an out-of-court settlement was finally reached in 1989, Union Carbide agreed to pay 470 million US dollars in damages. 
not that much when it's considered that by then it had already spent 50 million on legal fees alone. By October 2003, the company, which was purchased by the Dow Chemical Company in 2001, had paid families of the dead, on average, 2,200 US dollars by way of compensation. The recriminations and accusations continue. It was a foggy morning on Saturday the 28th of July 1945, so foggy that when Lieutenant Colonel William F. Smith contacted LaGuardia Airport on his way to Newark to pick up his commanding officer, air traffic control wanted him to land. He believed, however, that despite the restricted visibility, he could navigate through New York City. The last thing LaGuardia heard from Smith were the ominous words, from where I'm sitting, I can't see the top of the Empire State Building. At 9.40 a.m., having avoided several other skyscrapers, Smith's B-25 Mitchell bomber hit the 79th floor of the Empire State Building, sending fireballs through the offices of the National Catholic Welfare Council. Smith was killed, as were his two crewmen and another 11 office workers. There was one miraculous tale of survival, though. Elevator operator Betty Lou Oliver, who plunged 75 stories in an elevator car and lived to tell the tale. In late March 1997, 39 bodies were found in a rented mansion in the San Diego community of Rancho Santa Fe, California. They all belonged to a group called Heaven's Gate, an extremely insular religious movement begun in 1975 by Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Truesdale Nettles. The couple eventually became known by several names, including Doe and T, or simply the two. After Nettles' death from cancer in 1985, Applewhite and his followers became increasingly convinced that their physical bodies were just temporary vehicles. They also became sure that their real selves were due to be taken to another, more evolved kingdom via a spaceship trailing in the wake of Halley's Comet. Accordingly, over three days, the group planned and executed an exit strategy, which consisted of them splitting into small shifts to take lethal mixtures of phenobarbital, applesauce and vodka. They also secured plastic bags over their heads to ensure asphyxiation. When they were found, after sending an explanatory video to Rio D'Angelo, an ex-member who had left the group just a month earlier, all the bodies were identically dressed in black shirts, black sweatpants, and brand new Nike running shoes. They also each wore an armband reading, Heaven's Gate Away Team. Each was found lying neatly in their own bunk beds with a suitcase packed, plus five dollars and some change in their wallets. It seems the group, who lived very frugally, had taken up this practice to avoid being arrested for vagrancy. Prior to the discovery of the bodies, little had been known about the group's strict ideals, but the deaths changed all that. It was discovered that they were not allowed to have sex, and in the months before the mass suicide, several of the males had undergone castration, although there is some dispute as to whether this was to better control their physical impulses or to prepare for the genderless life they were expecting at the so-called next level. The group supported itself by building websites, and many of its beliefs and pronouncements can still be accessed via the internet. Marshall Applewhite believed that the Earth was due to be recycled or wiped clean, and the only way to survive this process was to leave it immediately. When he and Nettles founded the group, they claimed that they themselves had arrived on the planet via a UFO and were due to return via a process that they could teach to group members. Applewhite believed that it was Nettles piloting the spaceship coming to take them all to the next level. The youngest to die was 26-year-old Michael Sando, and the oldest was Jacqueline Opal Leonard, who was 71. The rest were fairly evenly divided between men and women. What was less widely reported, however, is that the events of March weren't the end of it. Two months after the San Diego deaths, two group members attempted suicide in a similar fashion in a hotel room not far from the Rancho Santa Fe mansion. Wayne Cook died, but Charles Humphrey survived before a successful second attempt in the Arizona desert a year later. The USS Cole was an American Navy guided missile destroyer that was attacked by two suicide bombers on the morning of the 12th of October 2000. The Cole was in the middle of a refueling stop at the Yemeni port of Aden when a small craft loaded with explosives approached on the port side. The blast caused an 11 by 11 meter gash in the side of the ship and ripped through the ship's galley, killing 17 sailors and injuring a further 39. 
Crew members fought to contain the flooding, and several support ships, including the British Navy's HMS Marlborough, came to the coal's assistance. The coal was later towed by the ocean tug Catorba to the Blue Marlin, a Norwegian semi-submersible salvage ship which transported it to Mississippi, where it underwent 14 months of repair before being redeployed. The attack was regarded by many as a precursor to the events of September the 11th the following year, with American investigations coming to the unproven assumption that it was orchestrated by Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda organization, with material support from the government of Sudan. This is the Watergate complex today. Built in 1967 in northwest Washington, D.C., the superblock of hotel, offices and apartments became notorious around the globe in 1972 when it gave its name to one of America's most significant political scandals. On the 17th of June, five men were arrested for breaking into the complex's headquarters of the Democratic National Committee. A few months later, along with the masterminds of the break-in, E. Howard Hunt, Jr. and G. Gordon Liddy, the five were indicted for conspiracy, burglary, and violation of federal wiretapping laws. But when one of the men, James W. McCord, wrote to the judge claiming a cover-up of the robbery, the floodgates were opened and the affair snowballed into a massive political scandal that reached all the way to the White House. It was eventually revealed that President Nixon and his government had been involved in an astonishing array of criminal activities, including campaign fraud, political espionage, and wiretapping of not only their political opponents, but also the press and ordinary citizens. A hidden Mexican slush fund was also discovered, used to pay for these activities, provide money for cover-ups, and buy the silence of anyone arrested. But at Watergate, it all began to unravel. In a Senate investigation, former staff members testified against President Nixon and his team. Over two years, the evidence mounted up, helped by the revelations of Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, and their infamous anonymous source, W. Mark Felt, codenamed Deep Throat. During this period, it became clear that Nixon's own office was wired, with him recording many conversations, including one that became known as the Smoking Gun, in which he detailed the cover-up at Watergate. The fallout led to threats of impeachment, but on the 8th of August 1974, Nixon announced his resignation, the only American president in history to do so. For such a relatively small country, the UK has certainly seen its fair share of railway tragedies, particularly around the greater London area. Unsurprisingly, one of them was at Clapham Junction, one of the largest and busiest railway junctions in the UK, if not Europe. At 8.10 on the morning of Monday the 12th of December 1988, a packed commuter train, travelling at around 65 kilometres per hour, ran into the back of another one, sitting in a cutting about 800 metres south of Clapham Junction. The impact caused the first train to veer to its right and collide with another oncoming empty train. 35 people died in the accident, all of them in the first two carriages of the first train. The number of injured is unclear, but there were at least 100, though some reports put the number as high as 400, 69 of them seriously. First on the scene were pupils from the nearby Emmanuel School, who helped save many lives and received commendations for their actions from the government. Investigations found that the cause of the accident was faulty wiring, the driver of the 718 from Basingstoke to Waterloo saw a signal change from red to green without turning yellow. Following procedure, he stopped at the next signal telephone to report the anomaly, but was advised that there was no fault and he should continue. Before he could do so, the late-running 614 from Poole, obeying false proceed signals, hit his train from behind. A fourth train, also obeying the faulty signals, managed to stop just 60 metres short of the back of the Poole train. It was discovered that sloppy work practices had left an old wire half-connected, causing the signal to show green when it should have been red. And a supervisor who had noticed the loose wiring didn't mention it so as not to rock the boat. Recommendations were made for the introduction of the automatic train protection system. But despite subsequent crashes at Southall and Ladbroke Grove, to date these recommendations have still not been acted upon. The inquiry also recommended the phasing out of the vulnerable 1950s rolling stock, but again, as of 2005, similar trains were still running on South London commuter lines.
The Torrey Canyon was one of the world's first big supertankers, nearly 300 meters long by 40 meters wide. She was built in the US in 1959 and had her initial capacity of 60,000 tons doubled following a refit in Japan. She was owned by the Barracuda Tanker Corporation, a subsidiary of the Union Oil Company of California. On the 18th of March, 1967, she was chartered to British Petroleum and carrying a cargo of 120,000 tons of oil from Kuwait to Milford Haven in southwest Wales. At around 6 a.m., the captain woke to find the ship was further to the east of the Scilly Isles than was intended. To go round the west of the Isles would have been the safest route, but it would have added 40 miles and precious time. So he made the fateful decision to take the seven mile wide deep water channel that lay in the 20 mile stretch between the Isles and Land's End. As the almost unmaneuverable ship negotiated the channel, an under-experienced junior officer was in charge of navigation. The Italian captain, Pastrengo Ugiati, who was also on the bridge, realized they were heading for a collision with a fishing fleet. But there was confusion as to whether the ship was in manual or automatic steering mode, and by the time this was resolved, it was too late. Cruising at 17 knots, the Torrey Canyon hit Pollard's Rock in the Seven Stones Reef and tore open six tanks. The resulting oil spill was an environmental disaster. Several methods of addressing the accident and containing the spill were attempted. To begin with, a Dutch salvage team tried to float the ship off the reef, but this was unsuccessful and resulted in the death of one of the team members. As the ship broke apart after several days on the rocks, the high seas meant that the use of foam booms to contain the oil was met with limited success. Over 190 kilometers of Cornish coast and 80 kilometers of French coast were contaminated by the oil spill, with an estimated 15,000 seabirds killed, along with large numbers of marine organisms. And the attempts at breaking up the 430 square kilometer slick actually exacerbated the damage. There was a heavy use of solvent emulsifiers, which were officially referred to as detergents to downplay the toxicity of their elements. 10,000 tons of these were sprayed onto the floating oil and the beaches. With the crisis threatening to worsen, English Prime Minister Harold Wilson held a mini cabinet meeting at the Royal Naval Air Station Cold Rose in Cornwall, where it was decided that setting fire to the remaining oil was the only option left. On Tuesday the 28th of March, the fleet air arm sent buccaneers from Nossiemouth to drop 42 1,000-pound bombs on the Torrey Canyon. The operation was vouched a success, even though the Navy was criticized in the media when a quarter of those bombs failed to hit a stationary target a stationary target 300 by 40 meters wide, no less. After the bombs, the Royal Air Force deployed hunter jets to drop cans of aviation fuel to ignite the oil. Over three days, a total of 160 bombs, 11,000 gallons of kerosene, 3,000 gallons of napalm, and 16 rockets were aimed at the ailing ship. She finally slid from view on the 21st of April. An inquiry into the accident was held in Liberia where the ship was registered, and it laid the blame squarely at the feet of Captain Ugiati and his decision to take a shortcut to save time. Belma is a neighborhood in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. On the 4th of October, 1992, it joined our list of infamous places when a Boeing 747 cargo plane, El Al Flight 1862, crashed into the Groeneveen and Klein Kruitberg apartment buildings. The plane had just made a stopover at Schiphol, where provisional repairs were made to engine three before the plane took off again. Five minutes later, engine three fell off the plane, taking engine four with it. As the crew slowed the plane while attempting to make an emergency landing, they lost all control, banking to the right and hitting the buildings. The official death toll of 43 has been disputed due to the number of illegal immigrants in the apartments. And rumors persist about dangerous materials carried on the plane and unexplained men in white coats removing evidence from the crash site. This was once the US barracks of the multinational force at Lebanon's Beirut International Airport. On the 23rd of October, 1983, it was destroyed by 5,400 kilograms of TNT packed into a yellow Mercedes-Benz truck. The explosion was described as the largest non-nuclear blast ever deliberately detonated. The truck had made it to the barracks by replacing a hijacked water delivery vehicle. Rules of engagement meant that sentries didn't even have time to load their weapons before the truck had run over a wire barricade and entered the lobby of the building, where the driver detonated his cargo. The blast lifted the four-story building into the air before the entire structure collapsed, crushing those inside and sending a shockwave and fireball in all directions. 
241 American servicemen were killed, the majority of them Marines. As the attack took place at 6.22 in the morning, most of the victims were still asleep in their bunks. 20 seconds later, another truck blew up the French headquarters in an identical fashion, killing 58 paratroopers, along with several Lebanese workers and their children. The Americans and French were stationed in Beirut as part of the International Peacekeeping Force during the Lebanese Civil War of 1975 to 1990. Rescue efforts continued for days, hampered by sniper fire. Survivors were airlifted to the RAF hospital in Cyprus or US and German hospitals in West Germany. On hearing of the attack, US President Ronald Reagan labeled it a despicable act and voiced his commitment to US forces remaining in Lebanon. French President Francois Mitterrand declared the same intention while launching an airstrike in the Bekaa Valley against the Iranian Revolutionary Guard in retaliation for the bombing. The Americans planned a military response, but instead the Marines were moved offshore, and only four months later, President Reagan, in an about turn, ordered their withdrawal from Lebanon. By April, the rest of the multinational force had followed suit. It was widely believed that Hezbollah was the organization behind the bombings, and several Shiite militant groups, including the Free Islamic Revolutionary Movement, claimed responsibility. Some in the US government, though, remained unsure. As recently as 2001, Caspar Weinberger, who was the US Secretary of Defense at the time of the bombing, said, but we still do not have the actual knowledge of who did the bombing of the Marine barracks at the Beirut airport, and we certainly didn't then. Heavy fog was a significant factor in the UK's third worst rail crash to date. At about 6.20 p.m. on the evening of Wednesday the 4th of December 1957, the extremely poor visibility had already seriously disrupted train services before the delayed Cannon Street to Ramsgate Express, hauled by the steam train Spitfire, missed two signals and ploughed into the rear of a stationary 10-coach electric train en route from Charing Cross to Hayes. The accident happened close to St John's railway station in Lewisham, southeast London. As the Spitfire's first coach concertinaed into the engine, the mangled metal knocked away the support column of an overbridge, which promptly collapsed, greatly increasing the casualty figures. Added to this, both trains were crowded, not only because it was rush hour, but because the fog had led to many cancellations and delays of other trains. In all, 90 people were killed, with a further 176 injured. Nearby householders called for ambulances, and with good road access, emergency services workers were on the scene within minutes. As there was no fire, firefighters concentrated on removing victims and getting the wounded to hospital. As terrible as the crash was, the outcome could have been even worse if it hadn't been for the quick thinking of one DS Cork. Cork was the driver of the Dartford train, which was traveling towards the overbridge when he noticed the twisted girders and managed to stop his train before it plunged through the gap and onto the wreckage below. Cork was hailed as a hero, unlike the driver of the steam train, W.J. True, who was tried for manslaughter in April 1958, acquitted following a second trial in May, and died the following year. This is Six Garden Lane Heaton, near Bradford in the UK. A more innocuous sounding address it would be hard to find. But in 1977, it was inhabited by Peter Sutcliffe, a man who would become known by his far more notorious nickname, the Yorkshire Ripper. When Sutcliffe was finally caught and tried for the murders of 13 women and attempted murders of seven more, he had been terrorizing the streets of Yorkshire for five years, from 1975 to 1980. Most of those he attacked were sex workers, but not all. 16-year-old Jane MacDonald broke the cycle when her body was found in June 1977. Sutcliffe claimed to have been ordered to commit the murders by voices in his head, originating, he said, when he heard Jesus calling We Be Echo to him from a headstone. Throughout the period in which he carried out his attacks, Sutcliffe appeared to be living the life of a regular citizen, happily married to wife Sonia. Yet his modus operandi was particularly brutal, as he preferred to kill with blunt instruments like hammers and screwdrivers. One of the most remarkable facts about the case is the mistakes and misfortunes that characterized it, leading Sutcliffe to slip through the police's fingers on several occasions. Early on, a witness misidentified a car, resulting in 300 police officers working on 12,500 statements needlessly. Several of his victims survived, providing police with the description of their attacker. Sutcliffe was questioned by the police many times over the years, but in the days before computers and cross-referencing software, 
connections were simply not made in the massive amount of evidence building up. There was also the fruitless search for a man with a Wearside accent, thanks to a hoax message from a man who claimed to be the murderer. In 2005, John Humble was sentenced to eight years in jail for attempting to pervert the course of justice. In November 1980, one of Sutcliffe's friends reported him to the police as a suspect, but again the information disappeared into the reams of evidence collected. In early January 1981, though, the breakthrough finally came, and it was pure luck. Sutcliffe was with sex worker Oliver Reavers in Broomhill, Sheffield, when he was arrested for the false number plates on his car. The next day, a knife, hammer and rope were discovered dumped at the place of his arrest. After two days of questioning and the revelation that under his clothes, Sutcliffe was wearing a strangely fashioned garment made to protect his knees and expose his groin, Sutcliffe suddenly announced he was the Yorkshire Ripper and began to describe all of his attacks. On the 6th of January, he was charged and he went to trial in May. Claiming that he was the tool of God's will, he pleaded guilty to 13 counts of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Four separate psychiatrists diagnosed paranoid schizophrenia, but the judge, Justice Borum, rejected the plea, and Sutcliffe was tried by a jury, found guilty of murder, and sentenced to life in Parker's prison. After attacks from other prisoners, in 1984, he was moved to the High Security Psychiatric Hospital, Broadmoor, where he remains to this day. The deadliest terrorist attack on US soil prior to September the 11th, 2001, was a homegrown affair. At just after 9 a.m. on Wednesday the 19th of April, 1995, a 2,300 kilogram bomb made up of fertilizer and nitromethane was detonated next to the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, a government office complex in downtown Oklahoma City. The explosives had been packed into a rented rider truck by ex-soldier Timothy McVeigh and his co-conspirator Terry Nichols. The final death toll was 168 people, 19 of them children, many from the building's daycare center just above where McVeigh left the truck. There were over 800 wounded. McVeigh was stopped and arrested within 90 minutes of the explosion. During his trial, he declared his hatred of the US government. Found guilty on 11 counts of murder and conspiracy, McVeigh was executed by lethal injection in 2001. Terry Nichols is currently serving 161 concurrent life sentences while a third accomplice, Michael Fortier, testified against McVeigh and received a reduced sentence. In the early 60s, the most pressing Cold War location for the United States was about 90 miles off the coast of Florida. For it was in Cuba that the revolutionary leader, Fidel Castro, had taken power in 1959, causing the administration of President Dwight D. Eisenhower to begin plotting his overthrow. It all began with the CIA's recommendation that Cuban exiles in the US be trained and equipped to take military action against Castro and his government. It is rumored that future President Richard Nixon was one of the chief instigators of the plan. Accordingly, anti-Castro forces were recruited and trained by the CIA in Guatemala in preparation for an invasion. But defects in the plot became apparent even before the attack could go ahead, with the Cubans learning of the plans, taking away the element of surprise. On mainland Cuba, more than 100,000 nationals suspected of being security threats were rounded up and imprisoned or executed. Then the new US President John F. Kennedy changed the proposed landing site from the city of Trinidad to the Bay of Pigs. This was done ostensibly to avoid charges that the invasion was US backed. It is widely considered though that the invasion which began on the 15th of April 1960 and was all over four days later, faltered in the air. Initial plans had been to take out the Cuban Air Force in several airstrikes, but after one strike, Kennedy cancelled the others, again to make the attack look Cuban and give the US plausible deniability. But without superiority in the air, and not receiving the expected support on the ground from anti-Castro locals, the invasion failed. Cuban losses were great, although exact numbers are strongly disputed. 115 members of the exile forces were killed, with around 1,200 captured. The captured exiles were put on trial, with some being executed and others sentenced to 30 years for treason. But a year and a half later, all were released in exchange for $53 million worth of food and medicine from the US. The whole affair was a tremendous political embarrassment for the Americans and paved the way for the chilling nuclear standoff, the Cuban Missile Crisis, a year later. If the nations of this hemisphere 
should fail to meet their commitment against outside communist penetration, then I want it clearly understood that this government will not hesitate in meeting its primary obligations, which are to the security of our nation. While aeroplanes are the more traditional vehicle of choice for would-be hijackers, in 1985 it was the passenger liner Achille Lauro that found itself commandeered by four men from the Palestine Liberation Front. The nearly 40-year-old vessel was en route for Port Said in Egypt from Alexandria when the group was surprised by a crew member, causing them to take control earlier than they had intended. Taking the passengers and crew hostage, they steered the ship to Tartus in Syria, demanding the release of 50 Palestinian prisoners. When they were prevented from docking at Tartus, the hijackers shot 69-year-old invalid Leon Klinghofer in the head and chest before forcing the ship's barber and a waiter to jettison the body in the wheelchair overboard. They had first separated Klinghofer from his wife, with whom he was traveling in celebration of their 36th wedding anniversary. Returning to Port Said, the hijackers negotiated for two days before agreeing to leave the ship and take an Egyptian plane to Tunisia. But on the 10th of October, US Navy fighter planes intercepted and directed the plane to Sicily, where the hijackers were arrested by Italian authorities. Although some believe that the ringleader stayed on the plane with other passengers and escaped. Years later, the Palestine Liberation Organization paid an undisclosed sum in compensation to the family of Leon Klinghofer, which went to a fund set up to fight terrorism. The Achille Lauro, meanwhile, after a couple of name changes, caught fire off the coast of Somalia and sank in December 1994. The Iranian Revolution of 1978 to 1979 heralded a turbulent time in world politics, prompting the coming to power of the Islamic leader Ayatollah Khomeini and the overthrow of the Shah, who left the country in 1979. The change in ruler had particular ramifications for the US, which had long supported the Shah's regime. When the ailing Shah requested permission to visit the US for medical reasons, the Iranian reaction was one of anger. A hastily planned protest was organized by a group of militant Iranian students calling themselves the Muslim student followers of the Iman's line, but it soon snowballed into something much more significant. Early in the morning of the 4th of November 1979, the group stormed the American diplomatic mission in Tehran to voice their objections to US influence in Iran. Unexpectedly finding themselves strongly supported by the Ayatollah, now dubbed the supreme leader of Iran, the students extended their protest, which swiftly developed into a hostage situation. Initially, 63 U.S. diplomats and three other U.S. citizens were held hostage, with six other U.S. diplomats escaping during the confusion, taking refuge in the nearby Canadian and Swedish embassies until finally leaving the country using Canadian passports in January 1980. Most of the women, and all but one of the African Americans, 13 hostages altogether, were released a few weeks later amidst hostage-taker declarations of solidarity with other oppressed minorities and the special place of women in Islam. The 52 remaining hostages were in for the long haul, however, their ordeal eventually lasting 444 days. During their time in captivity, the hostages were described by their captors as guests of the Ayatollah, but their treatment did not reflect such a claim. Blindfolded, they would be paraded before the crowds and media outside, and much of the time they were separated from each other and kept in solitary confinement. In the US, President Jimmy Carter decided against a violent response, preferring to appeal for the hostages' release on humanitarian grounds. Then he sought to put economic and diplomatic pressure on the country by ending oil imports from Iran in November 1979 and freezing Iranian assets held in the US. Foreign diplomats and ambassadors were allowed to visit the hostages, and through them, hostage Bruce Langham was able to convey messages to the US government. With the crisis stretching out with no foreseeable end in sight, Carter eventually decided more assertive action was called for. In April 1980, he gave the green light to a rescue attempt, resulting in the failed Operation Eagle Claw. The botched operation, which featured helicopters breaking down and another one crashing in the Great Salt Desert, cost the lives of five US airmen and three Marines, and in all probability, Carter's own presidential career. The November 1980 election saw Carter removed from the White House in a landslide victory for Ronald Reagan and the political stars fell into alignment, with all the hostages released on the 21st of January, 1981, minutes after Reagan was formally sworn in as president, the timing of which still fuels conspiracy theories to this day.
Little Bohemia Lodge, Manitowish Waters, Wisconsin, the glamorously named hideout of one John Dillinger and his gang during April 1934. Dillinger was one of the US's most notorious bank robbers with a lifetime haul totaling around $300,000, a huge sum in depression era America. The previous month he had absconded from prison yet again, this time from the supposedly escape-proof Crown Point, Indiana County Jail. To add insult to injury, Dillinger had used a wooden gun blackened with shoe polish in the escape and stolen Sheriff Lillian Holly's brand new car to make his getaway. Little Bohemia Lodge belonged to Emil Wanatka and gang members followed him and his family whenever they left the house. But Emil's wife Nan and her brother informed the FBI, who turned up in force a few days later. A fierce gun battle resulted in the deaths of three innocent workers and one FBI agent who was shot dead by gang member Babyface Nelson. Amazingly, the entire gang managed to escape. But Dillinger's triumph was short-lived. In July, as he and his girlfriend left the Biograph Cinema in Lincoln Park, Chicago, he was ambushed by the FBI and shot dead in the street. This was Operation Nimrod, the storming of the Iranian embassy in London in 1980 by the British Special Air Service in an attempt to end a siege orchestrated by the Democratic Revolutionary Movement for the Liberation of Arabistan, the group's name for the oil-rich Iranian province of Khuzestan. Six members of the DRMLA, protesting against the regime of Ayatollah Khomeini, had taken over the building six days earlier, on the 30th of April, 1980. But the event had only escalated into a military operation when they killed one of the 26 hostages, press attaché Abbas Lavasani, and threw his body outside. This was the catalyst that made British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher give the go-ahead to the SAS. Only 23 minutes after Lavasani was thrown out of the building, the power was cut and a charge was detonated in a stairwell. SAS men blew in the window frames and some entered from the roof using stun grenades to cause maximum confusion. Five of the six hostage takers were killed in the 15 minute gun battle, with one of the bodies later found to have 76 gunshot wounds. Another hostage was also killed by the hostage takers. The sixth and only surviving member of the group, Fauzi Najad, left the embassy with the hostages but was swiftly arrested. Convicted for his role in the siege, he was sentenced to life imprisonment, becoming eligible for parole in 2005. Due to the possibility of him being tortured or executed if deported to Iran, the British government was faced with the ironic situation of possibly being forced to grant him political asylum. On the whole, though, Operation Nimrod was judged a success at least until stories surfaced about hostage takers surrendering and still being shot by SAS soldiers. Significantly, the entire incident was captured on live television, with the BBC even interrupting coverage of the World Snooker Championships to cover the unfolding crisis, and reporter Kate Aidy catapulting herself to media fame by reporting unscripted from behind a car door for 45 minutes in one of the longest ever live-to-air news flashes. Palomares is a small Spanish fishing village in East Andalusia. On the 17th of January 1966, it became the focus of global attention when a B-52 bomber of the US Air Force Strategic Air Command collided with a KC-135 tanker while refueling nine and a half thousand meters above the Mediterranean Sea. The crash completely destroyed the tanker, killing all four crew on board. The B-52 meanwhile disintegrated, though four of the crew did survive. Of much more concern to the world, though, was the B-52's cargo. It was carrying four hydrogen bombs, probably of the MK-28 type. One of the bombs fell into the Mediterranean, but the other three landed near Palomares. The impact detonated the conventional explosives in two of them, and two square kilometers of land became contaminated with uranium and plutonium. 1,750 tons of the contaminated material were dug up and transported to the States for disposal at the Savannah River plant in South Carolina while the Spanish Minister for Information and Tourism, Manuel Fraga, and the American Ambassador, Angie Duke, swam off the local beach in order to prove the area's safety to the assembled media. It took 80 days to track down the fourth bomb, which was eventually discovered 760 meters under the sea in April 1966. Brought to the surface by the USS Petrel, the bomb was recovered using an unusual method, the Bayesian search theory, which assigns probabilities to map grid squares. 
The Americans were aided in their quest by a local fisherman, Francisco Simo Orts, who became known as Peco El de la Bomba. Orts had seen the bomb enter the water and could pinpoint the spot. Maritime law awards a nominal salvage amount for a successful recovery, but a nominal 1% of a $2 billion bomb is $20 million. So unsurprisingly, Orts made a salvage claim. The Air Force settled out of court. Towards the end of the evening rush hour on the 18th of November, 1987, a fire swept through parts of King's Cross St. Pancras Station in the London Underground. Although there was no smoking allowed on the trains, passengers would often light up on their way out of stations, leading investigators to believe that this fire was started by a discarded match dropped down the side of one of the old wooden escalators serving the Piccadilly line, which ignited rubbish and grease in the track. The station was in two parts, a subsurface section housing the circular metropolitan lines and the deep level tube giving access to the northern Piccadilly and Victoria lines. This was the area most badly affected by the fire, particularly the entrances and ticket hall. At first, people believed the fire was small, but the draft and winds caused by trains coming in and out of the stations added to its speed and fueled a phenomenon that became known as the trench effect, which caused it to flash over in a fireball with drastic consequences. The inferno was also exacerbated by a solvent used in the paint on the ceiling above the escalators. In all, 31 people were killed and over 60 suffered injuries ranging from burns to smoke inhalation. One of the dead was firefighter Colin Townsley, who was awarded a posthumous certificate of commendation for bravery. The last body to be named was 72-year-old Alexander Fallon of Fulkirk. Fallon had been living rough in London, and consequently it took until January 2004 before forensic evidence finally uncovered his identity. As a result of the fire, all wooden escalators were replaced with metal ones, and smoking anywhere on the tube system was totally banned. But even so, as of 1991, a report found that out of 26 safety recommendations made at the time, only eight had been properly carried out. The Tiananmen Square protests were a series of demonstrations by intellectuals and students in the People's Republic of China from the 15th of April to the 4th of June, 1989. Because of the tragic way the events culminated, the protests became known around the world as the Tiananmen Square Massacre. The roots of the protests aren't easily defined, though, nor did they speak in one homogenous voice. But two main groups were identifiable, those mainly urban industrial workers who believed that since 1978, political and economic reforms made under Deng Xiaoping had gone too far. And then there were the students and intellectuals who believed they hadn't gone far enough to redress the damage done by the Cultural Revolution and Mao Zedong. Particularly, the students were protesting against the treatment of the progressive former Secretary General, Hu Yaobang, who had been openly critical of Maoist excesses before resigning. His supporters believed he was forced to resign, and his sudden death from a heart attack on the 15th of April prompted them to gather in the square. Escalating tensions in the square resulted in up to 1,000 of the protesters staging hunger strikes. With Mikhail Gorbachev visiting the Chinese capital, the international media were in attendance. Accordingly, when the government's violent crackdown finally came, the images were broadcast around the world. On the 20th of May, martial law was declared, and at 10.30 p.m. on the 3rd of June, armored personnel carriers and armed troops moved into the square to clear what the party elders saw as a threat to the stability of the country. It's impossible to know how many people died in Tiananmen Square. Official sources say it was about 300, mostly soldiers, while others put that number at 3,000 and possibly up to 5,000. What is certain is that the events tarnished China's global reputation immeasurably, and the ripples are still being felt today.